This has been posted in accordance with Wisconsin Statute 19.84 Open Meeting Law. At this time, if there are any public comments, if you have comments for things that are on the agenda afterwards, please save them for them. Are there any general comments at this time? And then we'll move on. Move with the agenda order. I need a motion to move the agenda order. Okay, Mr. Peggy. I'll second that. That's so. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Carried. Move with the minute for the December 6, 2022 meeting. Motion to approve the minutes. Mr. Lumber. Second. And Mr. Anderson, all in favor? All right. Let's move on to number six, public hearing. Jason, please read the public hearing notice. Notice of public hearing, State of Wisconsin, County of Burnett, Tuesday, February 7th, 2023, at 9 a.m. at the Burnett County Government Center, room 165, Town of Mina, in Southern Wisconsin, regarding the following <clears throat> Burnett County Land Use Shoreland Protection Floodplain Ordinances. Number one, conditional use permit CUP 2217, Boardwalk MHC LLC. <clears throat> Public notice hereby given to all persons in the town of Oakland, Burnett County, Wisconsin, that John Baum, on behalf of Boardwalk MHC LLC, has made an application for a conditional use permit for the term of the Burnett County Land Use and Shoreland Protection Code of Ordinances. Modify the size of the parcel for the manufactured home community from 26 acres to 14 acres on Ivy Wood Drive and Wildwood Lane in the RR1 and RR3 zoning districts. In the northwest quarter, the northwest quarter, the southwest quarter, the northwest quarter, lot three and four, CSM volume 11, page 107, and lots five, six, and seven, CSM volume 11, page 110, section 20, town 40, north, and 16 west. Map amendment MAP 2213, North Camp Properties 5 LLC, doing business as do Forest Campground. To rezone lot one, CSM volume 27, page 306, located in sections five and six, town 40 north, range 16 west, town of Oakland, from RR3 residential recreation to RRC residential recreation, recreational commercial zoning district, zoning change requested by Michael Hirschberger and Steve Austin. <clears throat> Details of the proposed revisions are available at the Burnett County Land Service Department, Burnett County Clerk's Office, and on the Burnett County website. Conditional use permit CUP 2054. North Camp Properties 4 LLC doing business as Web Lake Resort. Public notice hereby given to all persons in the town of Web Lake, Burnett County, Wisconsin, as Steve Austin on behalf of Web Lake Resort is asking for a review of this conditional use permit specifically for clarification on condition number one regarding sites one through eight. Resort campground located at 30925 Namakagan Trail and 2659 Web Lake Trail in the RR1 zoning district lot two. CSM volume 28, page 227, section 16, town 41, north range 14 west. <clears throat> Text amendment TXT 2301, Burnett County floodplain study appendix. Public notice here, given to all persons in Burnett County, Wisconsin, that an addition of the Radigan Dam dam failure analysis hydraulic shadow in the town of Blaine is proposed to be added to the floodplain study appendix. Details of the proposed revision are available at the Burnett County Land Service Department, Burnett County Clerk's Office, and on the Burnett. County website. Thank you, Jason. First on the public hearing is a conditional use permit CUP 22-17 Boardwalk MHC LLC modify the size of the parcel for the manufactured home community. Mr. Baum is on remote. Is he on? Are you on, Mr. Wine? Yes, I am on. Yes. Please explain. Application. The application. Um, also, the owner of the of the company is on Richard Du Bois as well. And um, what this is in pertaining to is that we're we're combining um, the parcels together in the back of the of the group. And he probably could explain it better. Um, uh, uh, separating from the park. Um, there's some back parcelage that he, he pur just bought, purchased and he wants to combine that all into one partial. Mark Crosby, sir. Uh, am I muted or? Yeah, I can add some information on that. Sure. Can you finish this, Lawrence? Yes. 
Does Mr. Du Bois have anything to say? Uh, I'm here. Yeah, I, I think Mark could probably explain it. Essentially, uh, I purchased property to the north to use for hunting and uh, approximately 14 acres of what is currently uh, part of the Wildwood Mobile Home Park is, I, I would say it's pretty much undevelopable. And essentially I'm wanting to combine it to my hunting parcel to the north. That's pretty much it. Just to explain, um, this is Mark Krause from Wagner Swain. Um, this is his entire property he has now and the pink area is what we're looking to remove from the mobile home park. So you should have copies of that in there. He purchased this other area from the north side of the Pocus Yellow Lake golf course before. And the mobile home park is all in this area. There's a steep ravine between this area and the backland. He's looking to keep this backland for hunting and just utilize what where the existing mobile home park is in the front here. And the process was uh, during the course he, with the CUP he had uh, two or three years ago, he um, added one unit out there. And so last year we put the, they put the septic in, we marked the lines and defined where that was. They're busy putting the septic in last year and uh, the house wasn't complete when we were out there last fall yet. They were still putting decks on and things. And so uh, things dragged on. Um, and so um, he wanted to put, put a division line in here along the top of the ridge there that basically separates the properties. And he's looking to keep this as hunting and not have this part of the mobile home park. And if you look at their photos and so forth, it goes all the way back to Buffalo Lake. And so that's all natural and wild. And it's quite hilly back there. So it isn't really conducive for a lot of development anyway. And so um, it's probably better to serve this hunting land. And that's what he's looking to do with it. Um, you can see here's the golf course and the all the units are here. The golf course is here. And this is where we're looking to put the line right through this area here. And this goes back to Buffalo Lake on the back side. And then one other thing is that the hunting parcel currently was two or three pieces and, and similar to what we're going to do with Wildwood. Basically, when Mark is done, Wildwood would be one parcel and my hunting property to the north would be one parcel. And so we're looking to satisfy the CUP permit of combining the lots as a certified survey map. And what happened is we were in the process of doing this. Uh, we reviewed it with the Town of Oakland Planning Commission and we reviewed it with Jason. Uh, Jason reminded or figured out or saw that we were taking part of the land off of there. So that's why we're back here for the conditional use permit review, because we're changing the, the, the parameters of the property that's being reviewed. It's not changing what actually is being used for the park, but we're changing the boundary of the entire parcel from, you know, the pink area here, taking the pink area off and then each of those other parcels. So, so there any questions? Thank you. So there won't be any any building past that line then? Uh, not, nothing for the mobile home park. Uh, Mr. Boyd have a, the opportunity to put a house there, but that was the reason they were here already was he put his house in the park. So I don't anticipate, or Mr. Dubois can speak to that answer too. This reorganization of boundaries isn't going to limit area for a future replacement septic or anything in that right. type. Right, we had that in there. Um, there's ample space where it is. Uh, we're in the process of mapping the, the park too as we continue forward. So we'll have more information on that when the snow melts or whatever, but- uh, Oh yeah, it's gonna be a while. But that was the only concern that yeah. changing the boundaries, you know, you don't wanna wind up losing the ability to have a replacement right. area. And, and the valley in between is kind of their refuse area where they put their grass clippings and so forth too, and that'll continue. It'll still be his property and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, there's only one trail to rudder basically going back along the edge of the golf course. Uh, the other one that goes through the valley is just an ATV trail for walking, basically. So there's not much back there right now either. So thank you. Do members have any other questions? Questions? That time I'll. Open up for public hearing. Does anyone wish to make public comments on this application? Good morning, Don Hamilton. I live in the town of Oakland. I also um, am a member of the uh, Oakland Land Use Planning Committee, and uh, we look very carefully at this uh, application. And I would encourage the committee to give it your favorable support. Uh, this is a really good operator. 
And uh, we just wanted to make sure we have no problem. Oakland um, voted, the town board voted, I'm not a member of the town board, but the town board voted to support this, provided all the other conditions mm -hmm. um, of the previous cup are met. There is a, unfortunately, a chronic problem that we have with all cups. Um, these cups come back and forth and there's open violations. And it, it is disappointing to see that. Um, there's a CSM that should have been done. Um, there's a list, that was a condition of the previous cup. There's a list of all the accessory structures, sheds, decks, porches, garages that our emergency responders need. Um, so I would encourage favorable consideration of approving this contraction subject to these other conditions being met in a timely manner. Um, this needs to be done. This is a basic uh, compliance item and it's a condition of the previous cup in uh, Oakland. I know and, and myself as a, as a resident, we'd really like to see these things complied with according to the date that the member agreed to. Um, and again, I would like to echo Supervisor Conroy's concern that as long as there's room for a plan B for the septic, um, redrawing the lot lines isn't the issue, but we want to make sure that that this owner and perhaps the next owner, if they have a, a septic problem, that they have enough real estate there to make sure that they can replace an aging or a failed septic system um, and not be left with a problem where there isn't enough room because of this contraction. We don't want to make a mistake today that would cost us down the road. So if there's enough room for a sanitary system, and Mr. Krause has assured the committee that, then um, I don't see any other issue than uh, cleaning up those violations and making sure they're done in a timely manner. So again, I uh, I offer and recommend um, favorable support of this CUP. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Other public comments. If not, I'll close the public hearing at this time. Violation. They've been notified of violation. Well, yeah, they got a copy of the staff report as well. Um I guess I'm not going to speak for the owner too much, but I think, you know, they were trying to do the certified survey map, but now they're changing the boundaries. So that they have to come here and get that modified. That kind of delayed that process. Uh, uh, yeah, we still don't have an inventory. Um, the map, I guess, will follow up after the CSM is done or as the CSM is being done since it's changing the boundaries. And then I believe they got the sewer systems, though, all reported maintenance. So that issue is resolved. Well, we would, we would expect the inventory of those accessory structures and units to be as part of the map of the mobile home program. Yeah, that would make sense to do it while they're mapping it all, to inventory it at that time. That would two birds, yep. as it were, with one vote. Mm -hmm. We have the date in our staff report recommendations. We have date for that that we can put down there and make note that, that uh, failure to do that will result in some kind of consequence. What would the consequence be? Just out of curiosity. I mean, just nice to know that. Um, I forget that you he could find a citation for each day a violation exists and cumulatively run it if he felt the need to. I think generally when people are trying to get things done, we understand things can happen. But I, I don't disagree that having things linger for years isn't good. And so, yeah. <clears throat> So we just have deadlines attached to when they need to have citation authority. Uh, we could go injunctive relief or any number. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from people? Comments? If not, Jason, you wish to read the six consideration that we need to prove. Sure. Uh, number one, a complete uh, manufactured home park map should be completed for the entire newer, newly reconfigured parcel and filed with the zoning office signed by a licensed architect, engineer, or surveyor, which shows the manufactured home park layout, location of all buildings, structures, roads, property lines, setbacks, structures, water supplies, uh, private waste disposal systems, recreation areas, and any other information land use or information committee shall deem necessary by 7-1-2023. Any proposed changes in the approved manufactured home park shall be presented to the zoning office for approval. Uh, no implementation of the proposed changes shall take place until written approval is received from the zoning office. Number two, 
certified survey map to be completed by 7 1 2023 for this new parcel. Number three, land use permits be obtained prior to any manufactured <laughs> homes being added or replaced. Four, all prior CUP conditions still apply. Number five, follow all local, county, state, federal requirements for this activity. Six, owner complete and submit an inventory of all accessory structures by 7 1 2023. Committee has heard the recommendation. Are there any others that wish to add to the list? I just have one question. This one, I understand that the golf course is up for sale. This won't affect you. the sale of that won't affect these boundaries or anything, correct? Correct. There are no other conditions. Someone wish to make a motion? Motion to approve COP 2217 subject to the sixth staff recommendation. A motion by Mr. Blomberg. I'll second. Second by Mr. Schmutzky. Roll call vote. Roll call on Mr. Randy Schmansky. Aye. Brent? Aye. Ms. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Jim Payton? Yes. Fred Conroy? Yes. Laura Bickford? Yes. The conditional use permit CUP 2217 has been approved. Next, we will move on to the next one, which is rezone request map 22-13, North Camp Properties by LLC, rezone from RR3 to RRRC. And we have uh, Mr. Hirschberger as an applicant online. Yes, I am. You wish to explain the application, please? I would like our attorney Anders Hellquest to uh, do that as well, and our surveyor as well, Mark Krause. Mark Krause from Wagner Surveying. Um, as you all know, we've met. Uh, this was delayed. And we met with the town of Oakland for their with their planning commission and with their board, and the uh, reviews were not so favorable on our our behalf. But um, we'd like to present what we're doing here and uh, the request what we're doing. We're looking to rezone as the committee had recommended for all campgrounds to rezone from the, um, the current district they're in right now to be compatible in the new RRC district. Um, we, we think it complies with the town plan. Uh, they did not agree with that. Uh, we'd like to start with a few of the maps or drawings we have here, right exactly from the land use plan. This is page 74 of their Comprehensive plan, you can see up on the top here, this is red. This is a commercial district. So the statement on here is comprehensive plan use existing map, land use map. Um, as you can see, all the campgrounds and the bars and restaurants are all in the red spots on the map and drawings. So they acknowledge that they are commercial uses at this time, and that's what the existing use is. And so um, we're looking to, expect to uh, rezone the existing use that's shown as commercial on the map to commercial in the zoning district. And we're looking to be compatible with that. And nothing more. And uh, this allows for future expansion. And we'll go into some of the details that have been happening over the years. Uh, the property was just recently purchased. Um, there's been ongoing thing, going uh, process. Uh, there's expansion before. Um, there's maps that we have shown here and we'll go into those things too. And so with that, the potential, there's 135 units at the campground right now. Um, they are shown on our map here. This has not been filed with the county, but we provided this to Jason last year in April before the sale of the property, showing the existing uh, campground sites and the expansion area here. And as you can see, there's a big blank area in the middle north of the, north of the mobile home park. And that's where the potential expansion can go. Uh, one of the other questions was, uh, with the certified survey map, is the dark line below here. Um, there was a lot to the south that had the existing original owner's home with five, six units on it. And that was one of the questions that has not been resolved yet. And as part of the reason of what we're here asking for this also is that we don't know how to handle it for sure. 
they've made an offer to potentially purchase or deal with this gentleman. And the other question is if, if they don't buy the property, they need to relocate those existing six units someplace else. And then the ones, as you can see on the north, on the top side, as is, complied is with Jason's report, indicate that the existing old, uh, a lot of the sheds and stuff were over the lines before the setback rules and the 50 foot setbacks were adopted because this campground's been there since the 80s. And so um, there's been a lot of activity out there, especially on the riverside part. So as you can see, the expansion was put on the back side here. And so that's part of the process that's going through. And so if they're looking at moving those six units, they'd like to see where was the best spot to put it for new septic and, and water connections. And if they're doing that, they look at the potential for the other 15 units that they could potentially get in if they were to expand to 150, which might be plan two on this. We don't have a plans in place at this time, but that's the potential. And that's one of the reasons we're asking for the, the rezone to RRC so that we are com both compatible and that we have the right to come back to the committee with the land use plan for conditional use permit for an expansion if needed or relocation of the, the lots, which will be needed regardless. So that's kind of in a nutshell of what we're looking to do. Um, I think uh, you were sent uh, some information yesterday from Andres Hallquist on behalf of the committee. This is a very important piece of the land comprehensive land use. It says preferred future land use. Preferred future land use from their 2020 plan going forward to 2040. As you can see, it's red. It says it's to be commercial property. Yet on the town of Oakland's recommendations, they say it is not. So I can't tell the difference between something that's black and white on a map or red in this case and what they are saying. So um, I guess we differ on what their land use plan says. Um, this is the text, this is the text part of it. You know, their ordinances and the text are interpretation of their of their plan. This is pretty solid in what's out, out there or what their recommendations are. And that's what we're looking to comply with. Um, I think you also have a, a letter from the town of Oakland stating um, their, their reasons for denial. And the main one is, if you look on number one there, they talk about it's not by the commercial district, which commercial district is was just designated with their last youth land use plan update for 2020 to be along the intersection of 35 and C and uh, 35 and U and double F. And so um, that's where the town of Oakland store is in that area. Um, but their land use plan also says all these other red areas that are existing commercial uses would be compatible for their recommended commercial use. Um, they talk about being undesirable land. Well, it's an existing use. It's been there for 30 years. <laughs> It's not like it's incompatible with what's out there because it's been there that long. And so we're looking just to make it conforming with the new district on what it is and compatible to the other one. Um, also in the land use plan, they talk about future use and, and promotion of this. And we'll go, go to um, section thing about uh, desired economic development goals and objectives. In their existing plan use, they have Objectives, encourage resource-based industries, including agriculture, forestry, and tourism. This is definitely tourism. Further on the plan, it says promote business retention, expansion, and recruitment efforts that are consistent with the town use comprehensive plan. So they're supposed to promote business and expand business, allow business expansion. It says it right in their plan. And so that's what we're looking for the option to be able to do that. And further, um, we think it matches the existing plan and what they're what they're asking to do. And so for those purposes, that's what we're asking for that potential to expand or potential for the rezone so that both can expand, be compatible, and be with what the, the committee recommended all along in the campground reorganization of the of the districts. So perhaps here if anybody needs to Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I also make a few brief remarks? Sure. Thank you. Um, Please state your name. Yeah. Anders Halquist, attorney for North Camp. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and members of the committee. Uh, I believe Jason probably forwarded you our, our brief position summary that Mark 
uh, basically went over. Is that the case, Jason? Yes. Okay. Uh, for those of you that are seasoned, and I consider myself one of them, am I still like a paper copy of these things? I know iPads are great, but I brought paper copies in case you wanted to go along. And I'm not going to... Don't worry, you're not going to be bored into sleep by me going over point after point after point because I trust you all can read ahead of time and you don't need these to go on longer than it needs to. So I just thought I'd take you back on a few, a few extra uh, points and for the record. Again, as Mark said, you know, this is a, a 67 acre parcel. It's an existing campground with 135 sites. And really the, the purpose of this rezone is to bring it into compliance with what the, the county prefers as the, the zoning district for campsites moving forward, this, uh, this commercial uh, district. Um, the maximum that they could expand is an additional 15 sites here on a 67 acre site. They would more than meet the density requirement of, of five sites per acre. Now, in terms of the importance of the, the preferred land use map, map, again, up here in this uh, northwest corner, that's, that's where the property is. It's red, it's commercial, it's in the, the town's comp plan as being the preferred future land use. And there's that Oneida decision that I, I mentioned to you in the, in the summary where the Court of Appeals, which would be the same Court of Appeals that would hear you know, any uh, opposition or appeal from someone that doesn't like a favorable rezone decision here. You know, they looked at this type of issue where there is an apparent conflict between language and the map. In fact, one of the, the concerned citizens attorneys argued, well, you need to, you need to focus on the language. But the map itself very clearly designated um, in that case, that Oneida case, that it was industrial as the preferred future land use. When it got rezoned into industrial, that was consistent with the comprehensive plan. And so rezoning here is consistent with the town's comp plan, not only based on the map, but also some language. But in terms of that map, the court said it would be unreasonable to conclude that a decision maker may not consider those maps when determining whether a proposed change is consistent with the plan. The town's recommendation to you doesn't mention their map, doesn't take that into consideration even. They just apparently ignored it because they didn't like that part of it. I don't, I don't know. But the court, what the court also said was, the, when the map clearly designates the intended future use of the property as industrial, or in this case, we could substitute commercial, given that designation, the only reasonable interpretation of some plan language um, that appeared to be contradictory is that it actually, you need to refer to that future land use map. And that's kind of the same situation that, that we have here. And why we're asking for this rezone and why the, the rezone into commercial or RC is consistent with the comp plan and complies with Wisconsin law. Additionally, um, other comp plan language in the town's plan notes the importance of this future land use map. In one of these land use management areas, it says, well, we only want commercial in this one particular corridor. But then it also says, C, um, let's see, you see the C future land use map for other areas where commercial is desired. That's on page 83 of their comp plan. It's on uh, page 2.B I2 of, your, of the outline that you have there. And that's exactly, again, what Oneida County was looking at and saying when other plan language says look to the map, you have to take that into consideration. That, that would be the only reasonable conclusion that you need to look at the map. Additionally, other plan elements, um, other narratives of the comp plan in terms of expanding existing businesses, uh, policies that support tourism, those are all also uh, consistent with the town's comp plan. And Mark 
of, you know, went through some of the different reasons um, in terms of Oakland's four reasons why, it, why it's opposing this. But Oakland, you know, we don't believe followed its comp plan uh, consistently. And we believe they're acting in an arbitrary uh, uh, manner in this. Again, the, this idea that trying to use some narrative language to say the commercial district only applies to certain areas near State Highway 35 and County Highway U, those same, that same land use management area also says, see the map for this other areas for this desirable land use. What other desirable land use is commercial? Like this property has been for over 30 years. You know, we're unsure why they why they also claim that it's undesirable in some of these areas. Um, we don't know if they're relying on this idea of a thousand feet back from shoreland. As you know, uh, with Mark's presentation and and some very roughly drawn setbacks that you received, setback maps that, or a setback map that you received uh, in this submittal, a lot of the expansion area is 1,600 feet away from the Yellow River, potentially 2,000 feet away from the Yellow River. So this idea that they don't want that the town doesn't want expanded campgrounds within a thousand feet of the shoreland, you know, just just doesn't jive here. It just doesn't match the reality. And of course, there are other, you know, legal issues with, with the town's reasoning. And I don't, I don't really need to get into those with, with this committee. Um, you know, they're, they're presented in, in the position summary. But again, we, we'd really ask the committee to look at the future land use map. It's designated as commercial and we'd request a, a recommendation to approve the county board. Thank you. Thank you. Many members have questions for the applicant. Um, either Mark or Anders, the six sites that you um, mentioned that were south of the area, those are not in the red zone. Am I correct? Correct. We're not asking. That's not on on our. Problem. Yep. I just want to clarify. And but are those six sites counted in the current 135 total? Yes, they are. Those 15 sites, are they going, what about on the map? Are they exact? At this time, we have not designed it because we'll, we would look at the septics and so forth. The anticipation would be somewhere between where the old ones end and the new ones start. More likely in this area here, we have width on both sides of the road and that would determine on the septics and so forth. So we'd look at putting the uh, 15 to 21 in this area. Would that be relocating the six and adding nine? Probably yeah. Yes. No, it would be relocating the six and adding 15. So potential 21 total. Yeah. 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 But it still caps at 150. Yeah. Right. Yep. Either way, it's capped at the 150. They, they, they may buy this, and we may have to come back and remodify our map to include that lot with this property, too, would be another option. Right. And that's moving and acquiring it. Yeah. We, we'd look at it quite you know, Potential. So that's being discussed right now. So that's part of the ongoing moving parts. So that's on the portion of the road that's a private road, not a town road that would cross. Correct. Yes. Because it's kind of two, it's not two separate parts. Right. And we do have two entrances, one we have here and here. So that helps some of the congestion on the road it was when we when they put the road on the back side here so that it didn't all go this direction. So uh, and uh, being the new guy, um, this might be a dumb question, but it sounds like they're asking for a rezone. If we were to deny it, aren't, don't they still operate as campground? Correct. What, absolutely, yeah. So they okay. just likely can't, ex well, they can't expand to the 150. Because they're not zoned properly. Right. They're considered illegal non conforming units. Okay. Right now. And Mark correctly pointed out that we, when we were making the amendments to the ordinance, discussed that we would, you know, agreeable rezoning 
but of course it's subject to the rules of the zoning game as they are now. In the case of a town, it does have veto authority over a change of its zoning map once you're more than a thousand feet from the water line. And that that is the authority a town has. And shoreland zoning is the county's jurisdiction, but comprehensive zoning outside the shoreland falls to the town. So you know, for now, I won't. I'd like to reserve the opportunity to, to bring those guys back if we need to uh, after we open the public hearing. But I don't have any further questions right now. I got a question for Mark on the proposed placement of those. Is that anywhere near a wetland? There, there is a large wetland to the north, but we'd be at least 300 feet from that too. Because the letter we got from Dave Ferris stated about any new sites along the river or wetland, it'd have to have mitigation for. You know. Any any time we disturb more than an acre of land, we have to comply with the with the stormwater erosion control plans and so forth. And I'd envision that would need to be done here because we'd be dis disturbing more than an acre. So we'd have to follow all those rules and have an engineer involved with with the stormwater retention design and erosion control. So that would be part of the plan. That would be part of our seat. You know, mm -hmm. if we do. If we would submit a conditional use permit, we would have that information available at that time. And Ruth King or Matt Jacobson would take a look at that with the, the DNR. Any other questions from the committee or the applicant? <clears throat> hearing that, I'll at that time open the public hearing. And the first person I have on the list is Lori Cook. Laurie here? Yep. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Laurie Cook, um, resident of Oakland and treasurer of the East Yellow River Road Landowners Association. And so I'm speaking on behalf of the board. Um, the association is an association of residential property owners along the Yellow River adjacent to the campground. We are concerned with the proposed changes and the doors that could be open regarding expansion and use of the land if rezoned for commercial use. The proposed area is located within the center of a large residential zoning area, and we have concerns with potential impacts of, of a commercial property on the environment of this area. Even if the owners are only looking to add it additional campsites currently this rezoning opens the door for many possible commercial expansions going forward. Currently the association is granting the campground an easement for use of our private road for the entrances to their properties. Uh, the proposed changes would significantly increase the use of maintenance need of this private, private gravel road. Um, increasing the number of users of this property will add an additional strain on the infrastructure with increased demand for emergency services. And finally, we have a concern over the potential for increased use of the Yellow River. We believe the commercial rezoning has potential to have a negative impact on the river with increased river traffic, especially with the new bridge opening into uh, the Yellow Lakes. River use will become increasingly attractive. This leads to a concern for a strain put on the riverbanks with heavy traffic and non-compliance with no wake zoning restrictions. For this reason, the uh, East Yellow River Road Landowners Association Board is opposed to this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? Good morning, Don Hamilton, um, Town of Oakland. I was on the Land Use Planning Committee and I, I can tell you that this, um, this rezone has been carefully considered. There's been a lot of talk about the comprehensive plan um, by these individuals, but they're, they're misrepresenting what the color is. The, the comprehensive land use plan, the color on the map, when we went through and I was on that committee, the color on the map represents how it's being used, not how it's being zoned. The current use is a commercial campground. The town of Oakland recognizes that. The preferred future use color on the map commercial does not dictate or explain the, the current zoning wishes of the town. That is, a, that is in those ideas 
and desires, and more importantly, undesires, are in the narrative. The color is being misrepresented here. It is a campground. It is a commercial operation conditionally permitted in our R3 zoning district. The town has made it very clear over two dozen places in the, in the narrative of the Oakland Comprehensive Land Use Plan, it says no new or expanded campgrounds. I don't know how much clearer that can be. So to misrepresent that a zoning change is required because of a color on a map is simply untrue. That is a fabrication of what the intent of that map is. That, that is not an accurate statement. Oakland by statute, by state law, has the power to approve, disapprove, or for those municipalities that adopt county zoning, be silent on zoning changes. Oakland has lawfully exercised its right to say no to this land use map change. That is by the statute. They may not like the reason, they may say there were arbitrary or capricious reasons why, they have their version of reality as to why, but I would like to compliment the Oakland Town Board on being very clear and specific on why they do not want this property rezoned. They have no problems with the campground operating. As this supervisor pointed out, the campground is going to operate and may operate. There is no bar to the campground operating under the current RR3 zoning with a conditional use permit to operate a campground. There's, there's no problem with it being there. It's the newer expanded campgrounds and the rezone that opens the door to a litany of commercial activities that Oakland does not want there. That's why they said no. So Oakland was clear. They have a statutory right to say no. They don't even have to give them a reason by the statute. They can just say, no, we don't want this change. They have that right to do that. But they, they did explain to them why they do not want this zoning change. So I would recommend that this recommendation based on the veto authority that Oakland has exercised, I would recommend the committee deny this, this rezone application. Thank you. Any other public comments? Patrick Hanson, 11465 North Shore Drive in the town of Wood River. Um, thank you all for your service here and for your careful consideration of, of these kind of sticky issues on this rezone. Um, I, I want to point out, you know, for this land use, current and future land use map that's generating all this interest and discussion, had the town of Oakland not indicated the current use as a campground, as a commercial use, it would have suggested that the town of Oakland wanted to get rid of the campground altogether. And that is not the intent. Apparently, that is not the desire of the town of Oakland, nor of this committee. The intent under changes to county ordinances was to allow existing uses to continue. The question that Oakland faces is, do you want this use to expand in this location? As I recall, the town of Oakland held an actual referendum or a, a, a non-binding vote on whether they wanted any new or expanded campgrounds. It was 80% of the town said no new, no expanded campgrounds. And so the town is representing that in their recommendation on the zoning page. And I'm not a lawyer, but we hear the citation to this Oneida decision. My understanding of that decision is if you grant this zoning change, if the town grants the zoning change, then it will withstand a challenge based on the map and based on that decision. But Oneida doesn't compel you to rezone this land. It doesn't say you must then therefore rezone this land. So I would ask you to deny this rezoning request per the, the recommendation of the town and the, the local property owners. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Are there any other public comments? We've had no new ones come up. One. No. <clears throat> we have no new ones other than the one you got yesterday from that I forwarded from Anders. Are there any questions from committee members? Yes. New guy again, um, probably for Jason, but so I've heard a couple of comments that changing this zoning to RRRC opens up for multiple commercial opportunities and multiple commercial activities. 
in that zoning, what other than a campground could you have? Um, I could pull up the language, but I believe when I looked at it, it said like a daycare facility, a convenience store, and that's really about it other than residential. Yeah, I might add that it's a mixed use district, something we never had before. Right. And we, we recognize that campground is a commercial use, but it isn't a, it's a sort of a residential commercial use, if you will, for people are, as opposed to a bar or a used car lot or whatever. And so when we were looking at trying to get uh, kind of control of uh, additional uses after uh, at Wisconsin Act 67 of 2017 that limited discretion on denial if the applicant would agree to all the conditions the statute said you shall approve, which we felt preempted local control, took the towns out of it altogether. Okay. So what we wanted to uh, get that, we did not want to put campgrounds in a street commercial district though, because that would have really opened it up to things that you know, were not compatible with residential. So we created the RRRC district with the idea that it would be a sort of light commercial, recreational based commercial, but not straight commercial. Okay. That's more than you, you asked, but to get some background. So, so it opened up to a few opportunities, but not, yes, I can't put a manufacturing plant. No, no use car lot, no uh, hotel, probably. You know, it was, it was in, and in my understanding of this situation correctly, that we could approve this and then the town could just veto it. Absolutely. That was one of what the things I wanted to ask. Last week, last month. Yeah. Uh, the point would be I, I guess as good a time as any to talk about it, but we, we work with the towns, the comprehensive plan, towns developed, the county accepts that. Uh, you know, this is a conundrum in a way of. We may say, okay, that's not a bad request, but the town is adamantly opposed to it. If we would agree to the rezone, the town would veto it. If we deny the rezone, the applicant may appeal that or contest it. Uh, you know, my own thinking is I would like to see the town have another ticket to cat here, look at this argument, look at Oneida, consider whether they're if this is a modest enough request to consider, but I'm unsure that I would like to go ahead with this today, even though I hate to kick this can down the road. It's been punted several times already, but uh, I think, you know, and again, no, no disrespect to, to Andrews, but this came in kind of late. A town really didn't have a chance to respond. There is some case law and Kramer and Sons about having your ducks all in a row before the hearing, you know, so I don't think this meets that by the way, but but it'd be, uh, you know, I'd be okay with giving the town a chance to make a more formal response to the allegations that they're not following their plan. But otherwise, I don't see how we could really approve it either without them really denying it. So, and, and am I, I forget who spoke for the town, but am I correct that basically the town is saying we don't want 15 more sites? That's what it comes down to. Just point of clarification, I, I don't represent the town. I was on the committee. I'm a, I'm a volunteer for the town. But the town, the committee looked through this request through the lens of the comprehensive plan. And we, we apply the request and look at all the land use management areas to make a recommendation to the town board. And the committee voted unanimously that this plan is inconsistent and non-compliant with the comprehensive plan. And in the county chapter 30 ordinance, the purpose statement of this RRRC district mandates that the rezone is available, but it must be compliant and consistent with the town and county comprehensive plans. So the inconsistencies, the non-compliant, the contradictories in it, not the color on the map, the narrative in the comprehensive plan was the justification that the town board used to deny the rezone request. That is why it, because it fails to meet the county chapter 30 ordinance definition of what it takes to become this district. So we could rezone this and, and the town could agree to it. 
and they still would have to petition to expand the 15 sites. They would have to get a cup, even if it were rezoned, they would have to get a cup. But this idea that it brings it into conformance or compliances is not, it, it, not it, accurate. So I guess that's where I get hung up from the town standpoint. And unfortunately, there's nobody here from the town to represent or answer this question. But I don't understand the hesitance to rezone it because you still are in control whether or not they can expand. There, there is, and that's what Supervisor Conroy alluded to, that there is less local discretion with a cup than with a rezone. I think back, back to your point exactly, though, which is but why I was saying, well, you know, Mr. Hamilton is active in the plan commission of the town. He's not a voting town board member. Um, that's why I suggested maybe the town board should revisit this as well. If, you know, but I... I will still say, I think I would be, uh, I would not be in favor of approving it today, but I, I could see kicking the cat one more time and let the town make sure it's in agreement with it and just prepare to deal with whatever commotion may come of it. You know, that, Mark? Could I respond to a couple of the questions? Sure. Um, in answering, there will be no additional dock space because there's no additional frontage. The town board uh, decision was not unanimous. Okay, so the board did not unanimously vote to deny. And the other question we come back to the same issue is, what is the comprehensive, what is the town plan afraid of in the commercial part of this district? A daycare, a convenience store? And they keep referring, we get stuck in the middle here. We were told we have to go to RRC to, for campgrounds. We were already RR3 to start with. That's where we want to be is RR3, but we were told by the county and the committee that this is the only district we can expand in. So we're stuck in between these two districts and they're afraid of the commercial use. So to do is not call it a commercial district, but call it a mixed use district, which is what it is. Right, and, and if that was doable, I think it would would not scare people as much or have that use in it. And that's where we're stuck. I don't to. disagree with that, but I'm, I'm just saying the reality of, is that we would say, okay, we're going to go to rezone this. The town will file a veto motion, and and we will not be able to be approved. And I thank you. Uh, you know, I guess I just you know make the point that you know North Camp's request for rezone our our we're not scared of people much right now. That just said that's what we're stuck with. This. The place is haunted. Mark, I feel the ghost of Mark Krause. <laughs> are you are you there, Mark? <laughs> Still recording? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, you know, I guess I just you know, made the But now I can't. It's not recording anymore, so I don't know why it started playing. <clears throat> Got a new audio system in here over the last month or two, so... It's still, still uh, bugs out. Yeah, still working on some bugs. There's still some crickets up there somewhere. Something going on in the courtroom upstairs that we're getting. No. Anyway, I, 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 you see my point, right? That that I'd, I'd rather see us not get into this contentious thing if the town can look at this harder and you know, take, be be sure that they're solid with what they want to do. Well, I think what um, maybe if we just take notes on this, or I don't know if it's if it's not being recorded. Um, you know, our, our our North Camps isn't looking to pick any type of contention or fight with the county on this. You know, we think you know that's that's why we're asking the county to move forward. The town, apparently, you know, according to Don, went through this very very carefully. And they gave their reasons why they they didn't want this, and so we just ask for an up or down vote, you know, from the committee and from the board. And if the town wants to veto it, we'll go ahead and we'll deal with with the town issue. But we're not, you know, we don't, you know, we don't think this is a fight to pick with with the county. Um, I'd rather see, I'd rather see the town look at Oneida, and and consider this, come back to us with a position based on responding to your arguments because they did not have a chance to do that. You know, and, and just, oh. I'm just, I would just like to add in there that I was at the town meeting 
And um, uh, as most of you know, I'm very interested in expanding tourism uh, in Burnett County. And uh, it's very close to my business. So, uh, but, but uh, and I would like to see expansion. I'd like to see growth in Burnett County. But like the town chairman of Oakland said, 80 plus percent of the residents of Oakland Township said no expansion of campgrounds. And although he agreed with me on this, that he'd like to see it go and he thinks it should go, he had to vote no because he had to represent his voters in <laughs> Oakland Township. And until, until North Camp Properties could convince Oakland Township that this is a desirable thing instead of an, what most are considering undesirable, um, I don't. I, I have to agree with uh, the supervisor that we can't we can't move it along because it's not going to go anywhere until Oakland Township changes its mind or you change Oakland Township's mind. As much as I'd like to see it go in. Well, and you know, unfortunately <laughs> what we heard from Don was that the results are already baked in. Um, I mean, he sits on the plan commission that makes a recommendation to the, the, the town board. In Don's words were, the town has made it very clear that we will we will approve no new or expanded campgrounds. It, and so when that result is already baked in, I don't I don't think there's a point to go back and have them take a second kick at the cat. I mean, it's they've made up their mind. They've ignored the future land use part of their plan. And you know, we just if that's their decision, then we can we can deal with with their decision. But I think that's sort of what you said, then if that's if it comes to that, then I think we are compelled to sign as a town, really. Um, that's what I would do. That's unfortunate. In the year, in the year, not only my business, but any other tourism business in the county kind of would sure welcome 15 more people in, but if the if the township says no, that's zoning issues are not typically popularity contests either, and it's not that's a majority rule. That's how come the rules and the maps and so forth are made. It's not because it's a popularity contest. It's because what is right for the owner and what is right for the people are not always the same, the same issue. So it's a very difficult decision to make, but you have to weigh the difference. The fact that they're going to say they don't want more campgrounds is automatically just the same thing they could say if we want no more smaller lots after they already have their half acre lot you know that it's the same same scenario i've got mine now i don't want anybody else there so it is what it is on that so that's what we always run up against zoning and that's why your decisions are tough to make because of these issues that are become personal with the business owners compared to what the neighbors might want or whatever and the biggest thing we look at is what is the harm to the public on this situation if, if they can claim that there's harm to the public for what's going on there, then then bring that out. You know, that there's not harm to the public, it's just that they don't want it. You know, that's that's kind of the issue. So, you know, it's a very hard, difficult position to be in. So. Any other questions or comments from the committee? So I just want to make sure I understand. So you were saying that the, the town has no veto power over a conditional use permit. Town has input, but no veto. No, no, it, we always uh, solicit the town's opinion on conditional use permits. And you know, the arguments that that uh, they shall be approved if certain things, changes the, the burden of proof, you might, might call it, from the applicant proving it's a good idea to the local government having to prove it's not a good idea. Yeah. And that, that, that changed the playing field rather a bit. So. If no one has comments from the committee, I'll close the public hearing at this time. Mm -hmm. Alan, you want to leave your staff comments? That's all. Oh, you mean the, the concerning approval? Yeah. 
if considering approval, then the following items may want to be included in the motion. Number one, a complete campground map needs to be completed for the entire parcel, including existing sites and files of land services department signed by a licensed architect, engineer, or surveyor, which shows the campground layout, location of all sites, road, property lines, structure, or setback structures, water supplies, private waste disposal systems, uh, recreation areas, and any other information land use and information committee shall deem necessary by July, 2023. Uh, this was required by October 22 with CUP 1921. Uh, any proposed changes in the approved campground shall be presented to the Land Services Department for approval. No implementation of the proposed changes shall take place until written approval is received from the Land Services Department. Item two, camping units shall meet Wisconsin camping unit requirements. Item three, sanitary systems will be serviced and reported to the county by 7-1-23. Number four, existing campers, decks, screen porches, shed, patios, et cetera, shall be brought in compliance with all requirements by May 1st, 2024. Number five, land use permits to be obtained for all items before construction relocation. This includes all decks, patios, sheds, screen porches, et cetera, as required in campgrounds. Number six, no additional docking facilities are allowed on the Yellow River, Danbury Flowage, as required in CUP 1921. Number seven, screening as required in CUP 1921 still applies. Number eight, all applicable, all other applicable CUP conditions still apply. Number nine, follow all local, county, state, and federal requirements for this activity. Thank you, Chair. Any recommendations from the staff? Is there a motion? Another committee members. I'm not going to make the motion. <laughs> um, you you pretty eloquently explained it, and you lived there. I guess that at this time, I would have to make a motion that we deny this application based on recommendations by the town of Oak Brook. Is that how it should be said? I would say so. Yeah, I would second your motion. Not really. <laughs> we, we sympathize with the applicant's request, but we we think you have to get okay with Oakland to proceed. Roll call vote. Randy Schmisky. Yes. Rick Lumber. Yes. Gary Aqua Anderson. Yes. Chuck Anderson. Yes. Jim Payton. Yes. Rick Conroy. Yes. Sarah Bickford. Yes. Application has been denied. Map legal, but Next, we'll move on. Conditional use permit CUP 2054. Properties for LLC review of the number one Hirschberger is an applicant. Yeah, yeah, Mike Hirschberger here. I will once again defer to Anders and Mark. Anders Helquist, long time no see. Um, and just like last time, I did bring up. Uh, Paper printouts in case you, you folks wanted to ask. And we uh, we got this to Jason last Wednesday, I think, Tuesday or Wednesday. I think he's probably forward to it. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess I've read quite a few of the different comments that, you know, have been submitted here, but, you know, we're not, we're actually not here to request a change for anything. Uh, condition one speaks uh, for itself. Uh, we're not asking for a new condition. We're not asking for reconsideration in con of condition one of conditional use permit 20-54. Uh, we don't think any change is needed. You know, back when this permit was issued, I think there was some concern about this being sites one through six, at least being in the floodplain. 
and uh, subsequent review by uh, Mark Krause. Um, I believe the zoning administrator may have been on site. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong there. No, I haven't been on site for the floodplain stone. But, for other, but I've seen his you, map. Yes, you've seen his map. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, th this isn't a discussion about what's in the floodplain. Th these sites are not in the floodplain. So we can take that element of the equation out of it. Can I, yep. just, can I just make one clarification on that? Yes. Um, the issue about them wasn't that there couldn't be campsites in the floodplain. It pertained only to the water NR-116. What kind of camp units could be there? Um, by, under the floodplain regulations, they have to be self-contained mobile units and mobile small campers that are self-contained. And there were park models, and that was why that was an issue. But that, I agree, if you're not in. Yeah, thank you, yeah, they're, so they're not in the floodplain. So these comments about this, these sites being in the floodplain, that's not something the, the committee has to, to sift through and look at today. You know, instead what we're, you know, what we presented to you is, you know, the actual uh, support that we believe exists to show that sites one through eight are grandfathered uh, legal and have, have vested in those areas. And as a result, um, they are technically in compliance with the setback requirements because they're grandfathered. And we, we outline that through the position statement but the sites one through six on your map were approved back in 1986. And you can actually, and so if you go to the end of the narrative, for those that, that weren't on the committee at the time, you see where we've circled, where sites one through six are, sites one through seven, or site seven and then site eight. If you just keep going past the uh, the drawings from, from Wagner surveying, you get to the uh, 1986 document where there was a request to expand the campground from 25 sites to 45 sites. And if you keep going, as part of that application, they'll eventually get to a map, which we've highlighted, that was part of the application. That shows the sites that were approved by the committee back in 1986. And those are sites one through six that are, are still there and on the, on the property. They're numbered uh, three through eight on your map, but they're sites one through six for the purposes of this uh, conditional use permit. So those, those sites were approved under the existing uh, zoning ordinances in place. Back in 1986, they've continued to be used as campsites. Um, they've continued to have the structures on them. There hasn't been a 12 month lapse in their use or having structures on them. And so under Wisconsin law, you know, those, those are grandfathered from increasingly more restrictive setbacks like the wetland one, which looking at the ordinances, I. It looked like the wetland setbacks came into effect in 2017 or 2018. Well, I can give you some anecdotal history. Sure. Um, I can remember prior to 2000 in Washburn County adopting a 25 foot wetland setback and debating with Jim Flanagan here whether it should be 40 or 25. Okay. I think it came shortly after the Shoreland Wetland Act, you know, adding that mm -hmm. district to NR-115. And when that's when counties opted to do that. So it's been in effect quite a long time. Okay. I can't tell you, I can't remember when precisely, 
Yeah, and the, the ordinances, you know, online say, you know, 2017 or 2018, there are a couple ordinance revisions there in that section. So that's that's where I was getting that number. Yeah, I think it's, I, I, I'm confident it was earlier than that. And I couldn't give you a precise date because I was an Inverness county for one thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you were uh, doing zoning administrating duties elsewhere, if I if I recall. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but either way, in 1986, this this was approved under the existing regs for these sites one through six that are on this, if you want to call it a peninsula. And then you move to 2001. <clears throat> if you uh, keep turning your packet. I'm surprised the letter was sent down September 12th, 2001. That was, uh, that, it's hard not to uh, note that and think back to that day, uh, what was happening just the day before. Um, but what this said was it, um, the conditional use permit had been uh, granted. And if you turn to the first map that you see there, I've highlighted, in a, a kind of yellowish circle around two orange boxes. <laughs> what are sites? So you see the, the, the little highlight around those orange boxes. Those are sites seven and eight that were approved in 2001 by this by this committee. It was called the zoning committee back then, but it, it's this committee. And again, those sites have continued to be used and uh, the camping units have continued to be there um, since that date. And there hasn't been a 12 month lapse in the use or the placement of those structures. So you know, under under Wisconsin law, and as, as we outlined here, you know, we believe these are legal, um, that they comply because they're grandfathered. And again, no condition uh, needs revision and uh, which wouldn't require removal of those sites under condition one. And just a couple other you know, items you know, to consider. You know, again, we, we think there's been this reliance interest that has built up based on these prior zoning committee approvals and this grandfathering. Um, but you hear, you know, we we heard from uh, you hear from other folks on the lake saying that, that they're an eyesore or you know they somehow damage their property, and we completely disagree with that. You know, we included a picture of of the campsites one through six from the water. You just keep turning the pages a little bit more. Do you, you see the campsites there? Sites one through six. If you don't, that's because they're they're screened from the water and you, you can't see them from the water. And additionally, again, there, there are just these, um, you know, we have actual neighbors that have written extensively and you have those emails in your, in your uh, position summary as well. But one individual, Jason Adder, says, I have almost five acres of land that borders the Web Lake campground. I have never once thought that any of those campers are an eyesore or take away from the beauty of the lake, somebody that borders the campground. He also continued, there's thick foliage between them and the lake, which makes them almost impossible to be seen. And you have the picture there to confirm what the neighbor says. Another neighbor has uh, no issue with uh, site number eight, which has a, I think I used the word seasoned, a more seasoned individual staying there um, in, in terms of the, the property line setback. And again, site eight was also appro uh, approved by the, the committee. So, you know, we, we believe we comply with condition one. We don't think any change is needed to condition one. We were just asking to, to get a confirmation that we are in compliance with that. Yeah. 
you know, no, you know, we, we'd also note that as part of this, you know, uh, no additional structures can be added on here. I know Jason's, uh, you know, the zoning department has issued land use permits for sites. Um, I think most of sites one through eight, there might have been one that didn't have a land use permit, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank if there is one right now, Jason. Um, yeah, I can't remember exactly. Lots of permits out there. Yeah, but land use permits have also been issued here throughout the years. Um, I think it's you know reasonable to, to say no additional structures will be added to sites one through eight to expand their footprint because you can't expand a, a non-conforming use. Uh, and so we're not seeking to expand the, the footprint of these sites one through eight. Um, I think it's also reasonable to note that, you know, if if a camping unit is removed from site one through eight, it makes sense to phase it out that way. And again, we're not asking for a change there, but I think that's just a, a reasonable uh, progression here as as things go with with this site. So we'd ask the the committee uh, just to make a motion. Uh, that the Webb Lake Campground and Resort meets condition one of CUP 2054. We provided some reasons for you. And do you have any questions? Uh, we're more than willing to answer them. Thank you. Mark, anything? The only thing I'd add is if there's any questions on what we shot for high water marks and the ordinary high out there and so forth, uh, that shows up on this map. And anybody that's been out there, there's probably 150, 200 feet of bulrushes, cactails, shag alders in front of this site uh, for quite a while. And so we had a very hard time delaying in the wetlands what the elevations are, as you can understand. Um, the lake level on the two different days we were there was one, one was 940.6 and one 940.76, and that was after heavy rain. The regional flood elevation is 940.9 only three or four inches above that because the dam that controls Webb Lake out there keeps the water artificially high all the time or consistent out there. And so uh, that affects some of these wetlands adjacent to there. As you can see on there, what we used for our setback was the 941 line, which is very close to the regional flood elevation. We also put the 942 line on there, which shows it about five to eight feet back. And if you look on the wetland side, the wetland edge is 942, which is, higher than the lakeside by more than a foot. So the water is retained in the wetland and the marsh in the back before it allows the water to come out. So the water is actually higher on the back side of this property than it is on the front side. And um, we also took shots on the, there's a creek or estuary that comes out of that wetland area. And we took shots on the surface of that to see that there was flow going that way. And that was part of what we had talked with Craig and Jason about what they wanted to find on this because it's a very unique area. And so there's a lot of water issues. And that was one of the reasons why the floodplain issue was brought up and unknown and where the wetlands are and unknown because it is kind of a, it's a sloping wetland per se. And mm -hmm. so it's pretty hard to slope a wetland, but that happens in this situation. So it's, it's, it's draining into the draining draining into lake. So it's a live stream there actually. Yes, it is, yeah. So. Question the committee for the applicants. There's a night to discuss it further after we conduct the public open the hearing. Any other comments? If not, I'll open the public hearing at this time. First off, I have Carla Graham. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and uh, committee members. My name is Carla Graham, and I'm a property owner in Red Lake Township. Um, I'm changing kind of my narrative here after, you know, the attorney spoke here on behalf. This application or this cup was approved back in February of 2021. That was two years ago. In the fall here, they went ahead and appealed to the BOA that they wanted condition number one removed. Now they're saying they want that you guys to recognize it as being completed. I find that it's interesting that on the original cup, they didn't have all the information they're now presenting. 
The narrative keeps changing because they are trying to get out of completing condition one. It's been two years and normally appeals is 30 days. Why are you guys even looking at this and considering it when it's been almost two years? As far as grandfathered in, these are non-permanent um, structures that are on these sites. They are temporary units. That's what these camping units are, they're temporary. So how can you grandfather in a non-permanent, um, you know, mobile unit, park model, these camping units? Um, anyway, again, Mr. Austin agreed to all the conditions and to begin with, they keep changing the narrative. To me, they're just trying to get out of this. Um, and therefore, I ask that you uphold the original decision of the CUP and ask them to complete condition one. Thank you for your time. Can I ask Steve Pearson? I'm Steve Pearson from Oakland Township. Good to be with you here today. As Yogi Vera so artfully said long ago, this is like deja vu all over again. The applicant would like to re-engage you in a process that's already played out. You have weighed in, the DNR weighed in, the BOA weighed in. Now we're back to the drawing board. Any action by the committee today, any action on CUP 2054 may have unintended consequences and invite an appeal. You're being asked to agree that condition one of this cup has been satisfied, even though the setback issues remain and nothing has been done to address them. The record shows that the applicant explicitly agreed to comply with and satisfy the conditions of the cup as a prerequisite for the approval of the cup. So what does it mean to review and interpret a condition? Hasn't this committee already done that? Didn't the Board of Review take a second look at it and summarily reject it? The applicant is asking the committee to do something that is without merit and without precedent, thereby setting a precedent. What is clear is that the condition is valid and the applicant has not complied with it. And any action today inadvertently rewards non-compliance. <laughs> to re-engage with the applicant at this point is to leave yourselves open to the possibility of not only an undesirable outcome for the county, but the property in question. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Joe Sincata on live. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Joe Sincata. I'm an attorney representing a group of large group of property owners on Web Lake called the Concerned Citizens of Upper and Lower Web Lake. Web Lake has experienced probably the most intense increase in campground expansion in the county. The driver of this, in large part, is the use of relatively small areas of lakeshore property to operate what end up becoming permanent residential communities. This has happened over time through continued expansion pursuant to conditional use permits. The county ordinances require that campgrounds be temporary. Now, we have determined that they are not being used in that manner. We have filed a court case challenging the continued operation of these campgrounds is what are in effect not temporary campgrounds, but permanent re residences. The issue today relates directly to the concerns and claims in the court action. Conditions in cups, when granted, need to be honored and complied with. That is particularly true in this case, where condition number one is designed, really, to remove several units from very near the lakeshore. The applicant had the opportunity to move these units further upland into the operation. While that would be a positive step, what is really needed is to reduce the concentration of units and the pressure on the lake. 
As noted by staff and others, Units 1 through 8 are not in compliance with wetlands and shoreland setbacks. The placement of these units and the expansion of the operation is also contrary to the underlying policy of shoreland zoning. That policy is intended to limit and manage the placement of structures within the shoreland buffer, which is actually 1,000 feet under state statute and county ordinance. Because of that, the committee was fully empowered and authorized to require that these units be brought into compliance when it issued CUP 2054. And that includes requiring these units to be removed altogether if necessary. Uh, with regard to grandfathering, that argument is misplaced because the grandfathering analysis needs to be conducted over the whole property. When you expand the property, which has happened since one units one through eight were in place, uh, that grandfathering goes away. So we don't think that applies as per pursuant to my letter that I submitted. Finally, it does seem that contrary to the, to the approach of using these sites as temporary campgrounds, the applicant's plan is to continue to use the property as a permanent community and further to expand rather than manage and reduce the numbers of units at the site. The committee may certainly review any cut for compliance, but we believe should find in this case that there has been a lack of compliance and direct that the property be brought into compliance immediately by removal of at least units one to eight, one to eight pursuant to condition number one. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Please state your name. Good morning, uh, Chairman and Committee members. My name is Joy Dressel, and I'm a resident of Danbury, Wisconsin. As stated in the documents that you received from the DNR, Wisconsin's statewide shoreland zoning standards have required new structures to be at least 75 feet from the ordinary high water mark since 1968. The standard was formally adopted by Burnett County in 1971. And since 1990, the DNR has required a 40 foot setback from wetland delineation lines. So granted, there may have been a mistake made or overlooked in 1986, but the 75 foot um, setback has been in place since 1968. So currently, neither of these setback requirements are being met at sites one through eight. And as we know, as stated in condition nine of CUP 2054 and agreed to by the applicant two years ago, all local, county, state, and federal requirements will be followed. Currently, they are not all being followed. We are talking about campsites where units attached to trailer structures with wheels are parked. How difficult can it be to move them to a legally conforming area of a 55 acre property? If the applicant had access to over two and a half million dollars to purchase the campground in 2020, surely set aside the necessary funds to get the property in full compliance with all government regulations. After all, the campground violations were a known issue at the time of purchase. It's been two years since the cup was approved, which now puts the applicant in violation of the agreed upon condition for the last 98 days. According to county ordinance, the cup should be revoked. Please do not open the door for another stall tactic. I request that the committee convey to the applicant that he is now in violation of his cup instruct Mr. Town to issue a letter of violation, impose a daily fine, or perhaps you should just revoke the count. We have Corporation Counsel in the room today. Please use his expertise to clear up the applicant's confusion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Patrick Hansen, 11465 North Shore Drive. Town of Wood River, Brandsburg. Again, thank you for your service as we wade into another thorny issue, apparently thorny, um, for the applicant at least. It seems pretty clear to me. Um, I would ask this committee to affirm CUP 20-54. Condition number one of that CUP is valid, legal, it's binding. It's been in effect for two years. You could argue it's been in effect since 2017, but since 2021, it's been more explicit. The applicant has not complied and the applicant's own maps indicate that when you put a park model cabin in these campsites, along with decks, patios, and sheds, it's not possible to comply. It's the applicant's choice to have park model cabins there. 
we've talked about grandfathering and attorney Sakata, I believe is correct. And you could confirm with corporate counsel that grandfathering doesn't apply in this situation, but let's say it did. Were those park models produced in 1986? No, park models weren't produced until the 1990s. And again, can you grandfather a camping unit on a campsite, pick it up and move it? It's a mobile camping unit or it's supposed to be. So the question is, did the applicant ever intend to comply? I mean, I'll leave that for you to answer for yourselves. But in Burnett County, we have a history of doing business with a handshake, looking each other in the eye, saying, I'm going to do this, making a commitment to each other. Anderson and Jensen families in Grantsburg, in the Grantsburg Bank, that's how they did business for three generations. That's my wife's family and our dear friends. And that apparently is not how certain actors are doing business here in the county today. They will say two years ago, they will agree to a deal. And two years later, they will do all they can to get out of it, argue grandfathering, argue floodplains, make a whole cloud of confusion. This is pretty straightforward to me. The condition is clear. You gave them two years. I would even say that in 2021, what you essentially did was an enforcement action. To the extent that the county does enforcement, you do it through conditions in cups, saying we're going to grant you this expanded use, so please clean things up. You gave him two years to do that. He didn't comply. He has no intention of complying. And our fear, my fear, many fear, that what will come out of this is just another delay tactic. And if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. He's driving 85, 90, 100 miles an hour in a 55 mile limit zone, while the rest of us schmucks all drive 55 miles an hour and do our best to reasonably comply with the expectations set on us. So please affirm CUP 2054 and convey to the applicant that he has not complied. Thank you. Any other public comments? Good morning, Don Hamilton, Oakland Township. I'm really glad this one's not in Oakland. I'd like to say that up front. Um, this is an interesting one. It, it's really, to me, never been about, um, I don't think this is about grandfathering. This isn't, this is about the applicants as other people have stated, their refusal to move the park models. That was the issue when John and Maria Rosenthal stood here. I was here at that meeting. It's the same issue when Steve Austin was here and expanded the campground. The issue was about moving the park models to comply with the setback. And every time you apply for a CUP, there's a standing condition that land services puts in there. And that's that the applicant agrees to follow all local, county, and state regulations. The setback is a setback. Pampers have never been exempt from setback. They are portable. This is not about grandfathering campsites. The campsites are fine. It's the type of camper that's on them. They can be moved. He said he would be. He would move them. You directed him to move them. He agreed to move them. This is the third strategy. There's the do nothing strategy that John and Maria Rosenthal successfully executed. Steve did the same thing for two years. That So the do nothing strategy was there. Then the board of adjustment strategy, that didn't work. Now we're here today saying, well, you know, we've looked at this and we comply with it. This is about a refusal to move the campers. It, this is very simple. These are campers, they're portable. If they move them, Condition one is satisfied. So I would I would recommend the committee re clarify the condition one compliance means what it says, move the campers. Confirm that the applicant understands continued inaction, not moving them, violates condition one. And in accordance with chapter 3657, paragraph C, sub two, I would suggest land services immediately issue a notice of violation regarding non-compliance of condition one because of the egregious amount of time that is passed. And number two, issue a cease and desist order to the applicant. I do not believe he should offer or allow anyone to use, occupy, or reside in any of the campers or campsites in condition one until such time land services has notified the applicant in writing that the condition is complied with. I think that is a reasonable expectation of this operator to not use those campsites until he complies with condition one. You can put a different camper on there and use them. The park models need to go. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. And I recommend that the campers be moved. Thank you. Any other public comments? Any other public comments? 
Mr. Brown, I'll close the public hearing at this time. <clears throat> Questions and comments from the committee? I, I have one I'd like to pose to, to Anders. On, on your, your um, summary, you're arguing that, that their grandfather didn't do the 75 foot setback that they don't meet? Well, you know, it's it's either that or, you know, with Mark's uh, explanation with the ordinary high water mark, there's a question whether they are even violating that 75 foot setback. Well, I'm, I'm going to just narrate what I, what I think about that, which is, uh, as was testified to earlier, that setback has been in required and required of the tampering units themselves since, in the case of Burnett County, 1971, when they adopted zoning. It, uh, the NR 115 and the you know, county side a couple of years to get into compliance from the 68 law. So, but anyway, I think Jason has that date, isn't it? March? Oh, I think it was March 8th. 71, I believe. In any event, the, yeah. the, the, 15 years later in 1986, the Land Use Committee and the Zoning Administrator certainly knew that the campers had to meet the 75 foot setback. The, the camp sites could be, you know, down in that peninsula, but the campers themselves have to meet the setback. Um, then in 2001, how that one that got approved. The entire camper unit is inside the 75 foot setback. Now, I don't know. <laughs> they made, made a mistake, I think. But the point being uh, that that is that's the issue. And there are four of them based on the work Mark did as carefully as he could. We use elevation for an ordinary high because it's repeatable. Almost any other you know, subjective estimate of where it is. This can't be replicated really. So we have benchmarks and we use elevation for ordinary high. It's the only way you can repeat it really. So I think I, in my opinion, you you don't aren't in compliance because four of them are still in, encroaching into the 75 foot setback. We don't need to go any further. We don't need to talk about the wetland setback or lot line setback or anything else because that one, to my mind, single most important element is not there. I just want to make one comment real quick while you guys were all listening and, and to all this. I was going through old historic ordinances, trying to find stuff. In August of 77, there was a requirement that campgrounds uh, had a 50 foot setback requirement. Mm -hmm. So that was in August of 77. Oh. But I can't, uh, 95, there was no wetland setback in 95. Mm -hmm. I don't have ordinances for every year. So in 2009, there was. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in that maybe 2000-ish 2000 2000 or so, moment, I would think, yeah. the wetland setback might have came into play. 50-foot wetland setback for campgrounds, does that mean camp sites? 50-foot uh, side rear lot oh, line setback. Line. Sorry, I thought you were talking ordinary high. No. That was a 50 foot lot line setback in August of 77. And I, again, that's a different one. Yeah. But, but I'm, I'm thinking the simple question was are you, are, are, you know, are we compliant with this? Eight units are compliant with the first condition of the approval. And I would say no, they're not. Just done with ordinary high, nothing else. You could, you could debate the other things about, you know, grandfather in wetland setback or not. You know, those are different matters um, that could be discussed. But the one that's an absolute, I think, is the 75 foot setback. I don't think a camper can be considered a non conforming structure because it's not permanent. The, the campsite can be considered a non conforming structure. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to meet the setback. And how does the board deal with basic non-compliance? I mean, there was an agreement that wasn't honored. I'll defer that to Jason this time. <laughs> well, um, you know, we, we use the right of notice of violation, 
try to get them to straighten it out. That's usually step one. And then after that, we decide with court counsel, I would talk and I would decide, are we going to do citation route or bring them back to the uh, committee to potentially revoke their CUP? Ultimately, I guess it'd be kind of up to us and court counsel to decide which route we want to go. Revoking their CUP, would that be the additional campsites that we let them have on? Well, I think in theory you revoke the whole thing. Well, that's separation between the say the whole campground goes away. Right, Dave, if you revoke the CUP. We'd have to look at it, but that is a potential problem, yeah. I guess. We'd have to look at how they're tied together. <clears throat> Whether a court would actually move like that. So yeah. <laughs> Are you saying there's only four sites that are non-compliant? No, I'm saying that there are four that don't satisfy the 75 foot setback based on the documents submitted to us today. If you look, if you look at that sketch, mm -hmm. you'll see. Well, you would be talking then about sites what four, five, six, and eight. Yeah, I think so. One is the very south side on the peninsula, and then they go, with, and then eight is the one that's tucked to the north of the third, cabin. Third, fourth, and fifth from the bottom, well, get 75 feet, and then the, the farthest one to the north, that's fine. That's site eight. Site eight is in 75 feet entirely behind it. It's just, um, you know, Odd that it's there where I sleep. There's a map in your packet, the concept plan. Yeah. Well, there's a better one, the concept plan, if you're looking kind of for site numbering. Mm -hmm. It shows how the site, it's like an overall map of the campground. It's approximately page five. Roughly page five. You got what Andre is handed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of what honors handed out today is roughly page five. Yeah, I, I don't want to complicate this more than necessary either. Because a simple question is in fact, in my mind. It it sounds like we treat park models differently. We don't. Uh, the floodplain regulations do, but floods, park models are larger. That's all. Um, let, let's go back a little bit to that 86 approval. The, the sketches shown in the 86 approval show enough room for the campers as they existed in 86, I think, to fit without any encroachment into the setback. And there wasn't a wetland setback then. You know, and that was uh, Mr. Hamilton kind of mentioned that in passing that that a small behind your car, pickup yeah. truck, or motorhome campers would have fit fine when they were only eight feet wide, right? Um, and, that, and that's I said, I don't think the committee said, well, we don't have to follow a 75 foot setback. I think the committee's expectation in 86 was the campers would be 75 feet back. And I, again, that in 70, like 2001, it looks like one got approved that wasn't. I'm not sure how. We won't, you know, we're correcting an error then in that case. Number eight was not included in the number one. One, pardon? I think it was the six here and not the number eight. Yeah. Yes. That no, that was one. a different, that was a later approval, 2001. I mean, you know, our CUP. Right. Was that included in that? Yeah, that was that was one. That was it was sites one through eight is the ones that we mentioned when we did the latest C U P the last U P because it was worded that they were either within the floodplain, uh, wetland, uh, side setback, or a shoreland setback. The four kind of things we're was, looking at was, again because of the nature of the difficult to look at and. We, we had the benefit of looking at high resolution ortho photos with two foot contours 
a foot positional accuracy. And we still couldn't tell for sure. And that's why it needed to be field boots on the ground verified. This cup has already been litigated. I don't know what we're doing here necessarily. I think that there should be some action taken to meet the next meeting, maybe to uh, start termination of this cup. Well, I, I think uh, today I, I, I would be willing to make a motion that, that uh, that we don't find them to be in compliance with that. That was what the request was today. Anything else, we would, it would have to be a process to go any further. Next meeting or whatever. Or whenever, subsequent meeting, further discussion, perhaps with, with Mark and Andrews and Jason. To, I didn't make a motion. I just made a. I, I said, I, if there's, if, if, you know, if you want a motion, I'd make a motion just that we, we find that they are not in compliance with, with the request as they made it. And that would be all I would do today. That they didn't follow their instructions on the original cut. Right. They, they wanted yeah. to, but the, but the letter, it's just a letter. It's not an application. It's not a, not a, not an issue about revocation or anything else. It just asks that we, we interpret whether they are or not in compliance. We really don't have to do anything though, do we? Well, we need to decide that yeah. that question, and the question I would say is no, you're not in compliance. You still have camping units mm -hmm. within the 75 foot setback; they have not it's not been remedied, and that's all. I don't go any further today. So then, does that imply that we do not think there's any grandfather? We don't agree we're, with that. We're uh, yeah, we're not addressing it. We're standing by the yes. original decision. We we just we have made the decision earlier. Two years you need to be removed within two years or within that time period, and they haven't done it. All we're just all we're saying is they did not comply with the cup that we gave them. Okay, and did and because I wasn't here two years ago, somewhere it states that they need to remove the unit. yes, because it doesn't state that in number one condition number one. Um, was, it states that they need to comply. Yeah. And if they think they're in compliance, then I understand why they didn't remove them. But if, if we at some point said you need to remove these, well, that's different. I, I just if we're finding that they're not in compliance, then they have they need to get into compliance and figure out how they're going to do that. Didn't they have two years to do that? Pardon? Didn't they have two years to do that? Yeah, October 1st of 22 is when it was the date. So it's been over two years and over two years. And well, yeah, 2054. I don't know when that was approved. Um, being that number it was probably late in 2020. So they would have had 2021 and 2022 basically seasons, camping seasons to it. That's when they were supposed to be in compliance was by October of 2023. So I've had it. Um, we verified the floodplain issue right away, you know, immediately. So we knew that the floodplain was not an issue. We did the actual delineation based on providing more information to Jason and Craig on at, you know, one of the dates we were out here on this map. So that's when we provide additional information based on the questions that were raised with uh, with the wetland setbacks and the. They, they did work on it. They provided information and. So we have discovered more as a result of that. But the issue was those were all issues in doubt and resolved it. So. so from my perspective, how I understood it is that they had to meet all the requirements that are in apply today. That was the, because you have the other condition that says follow a local county state federal requirement. So that's how I interpreted it. Um, I think, um, the applicant interprets it differently, I believe, um, that it, some of those are grandfathered in or whatever else. So I think that's the sticking point, you know, that no, no disagreement. Did the committee that. mean it to be that they have to meet all requirements today or 
right. and requirements at the time that they were essentially placed there. Uh, but I'm, I'm to answer the question today of whether they're in or not, uh, they're clearly not in at least one. The others, uh, I would want to, I think, revisit that. But if we were going to do that, I would want to do that in a <coughs> to the voice. And I think we'd have to discuss that in a session with Corp Council to determine what uh, we would do going forward. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, and while, while, you're, while you're catching your breath, I, they were out at the site and they were looking at the main issues before this deadline occurred. They were looking at this. So that's, I mean, this is something that was done before this October 31, 2022 deadline in terms of going to, to the site. And maybe I'm lost a little bit. And um, I thought there was an agreement that they were at some point that they were going to move those. Or was that? Well, that's what it, it sure seems like the public thinks that because I've had a few people reach out to me going, why are those sites not moved yet? Um, so, yeah, I don't I don't know. There's a perception or something that they were going to be moved, I think, whether <clears throat> perception is reality all the time. You know, part of that, I think, grew out of the floodplain thought that people that there couldn't be any campers in the floodplain, but mm -hmm. that isn't accurate. So that may have been misunderstood, but it is, uh, you know, it's not like Mark told you, it's just really a small floodplain and it's low elevation, really low down there, regardless. Um, but uh, the, the issue was not, not a compliance with setback. Ooh, both wetland and ordinary high water mark, they're all non compliant to the wetland setback. And all of them are. Non compliant to the ordinary high as they exist. And I understand they may have started looking before October, but that just seems, I mean, if there was like two years prior to that, they had to get into conformance. And because that was part of the agreement of a cup was to be in that compliance. Was the, that was a decision that the committee voted on. Yeah. And that's what compliance of all applicable, as Jason said. And uh, Supervisor Shemansky, you know, you know, pointed out the, you know, here's what the language of the condition is. You read that. And I understand the, the committee's perspective here um, in terms of what applies and when. And I understand where, where you're coming from, um, Vice Chair Conroy. But there was the, uh, the legitimate issue in question of grandfathering, especially based on prior committee action and swear. You know, the condition does not read sites one through eight shall be removed. It, it says shall comply with applicable regulations and with grandfathering, newer, more stringent, you know, requirements sometimes do not comply. So I, I don't want, I just want to make sure there's no, you know, this wasn't something that was gone about in bad faith by, by North Key. So, you know, it had been examined before. There was ambiguity on the condition. It was an artfully worded as a variance and the board of adjustment said, this is a committee decision. So we came back to the committee and made that request. And we said, here's why we think we're in compliance with condition one. We made a, are about to make a determination, I think, that disagrees with that. And that's something we'll just need to work through with, with uh, the committee and, and Jason and, and Corp Council on how to. I think just the fact that they acknowledged that there was ambiguity, there was awareness that it was an issue prior to October. But in any case, I think we can agree it's in non compliance. Well, I, I did make that in the form of a motion. I'll second that. <laughs> Can you repeat the wording of the most? Um, I think we have it. I just said you find that they're not in, not in compliance with that. That was a very simple motion. Yeah, I have, I have applicant is not in compliance 
with the COP light dash 54 item one. A motion and a second. I don't understand. All we're saying is that he, he hasn't compiled yet. Right. And we need to move forward to find out what our options are if we continue as non compliance. Right. So you got work to do. Yep, me and Dave can go. Yep. That's an agenda. That would be in a further agenda item another day. Well, I don't know if we'll bring it back to the committee right away. I'm sure we'll work, try to work together to come up. Oh, uh, yeah, it would have to be a public hearing to try to revoke it. Yeah. If it got to that point. If it got to that point, yeah. But between you and council and North Camp, there could be some adjustments made to yep. be in compliance. Okay. We would certainly hope so. Now, the committee's made it very clear they're not in compliance. There is no ambiguity. Um, I I would just like to throw out there that when you have that discussion, I'm not concerned about the owners. I'm concerned about the eight people and their families that this is going to affect and that we have a little compassion and give them time to for the snow to melt and move their stuff. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't think we're not really known for being, uh, I think, overly, you know, Forceful, forceful, and trying to get people out, you know, the next day. So I think our, our trend is we're pretty good about trying to work with people to get them into compliance. Driving through there last week, there's no way anybody could be moving out in the next yeah. couple no. of days anyway. No. Uh, even after the snow is completely gone, the attachments or the uh, additions that have been made there are going to take some time to disassemble. I mean, even if so hypothetically, if we couldn't come to an agreement and we went the citation route, route, I mean, heck, you know, Anders knows once you get in court, things really start to slow down on movement. So, um, darn lawyers, yes, the lawyers you know, <laughs> slow everything down. So, um, man, only fair corner Shakespeare, okay. The motion is to have Jason and court counsel. Well, I think the motion was just the committee finds they're not in compliance. Mm -hmm. And that was it. They're kicking it back to Kick it to us to try to figure it out. Yep. We're putting the ball in somebody else's court. Yep. Yeah. Not in compliance with what we, we asked it two years ago. Yep. Right. Roll call vote. Mr. Schminsky. Yes. Mr. Blomberg. Yes. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Payton. Yes. Mr. Conroy. Yes. Mr. Bickford. Yes. We're working out. <laughs> Job security. Next. Thank you, the members of the committee. <laughs> Next on public hearing portion is B, text amendment PXT 2301. Study for adding red and yeah. All right, so this um, this is a requirement for us to do to basically add it to our floodplain ordinance. So then that we um, 
basically what happened here is there was a, a, a engineering study done on the hydraulic shadow if the dam fails. Yeah, so <laughs> that's probably why they had the study done. Um, so then the study uh, basically comes up with a shadow is what they call it of if the dam fails, where do they anticipate flood water is going to go. And by adopting this study as part of our ordinance, then we're regulating construction and things, basically not allowing construction and things to be placed in that shadow area. Um, we have to uh, adopt this though to make it part of our ordinance so then we can apply it. Basically, it's a pretty informal process. We, I think the last one we did was the Clam Falls Dam like six years ago. These don't come through very often, so. A notice was sent to the um, all the people um, along the river there uh, in Burnett County. It's really only uh, one or two people, and county land is most of the most of the property up there. So, just for the committee, ones that were not here before, the Radigan Dam is actually in Douglas County, but the shadow that we have to approve is. In Burnett County. Just, yeah, so we're just approving the portion in Burnett County. Douglas County would approve the shadow in, in their county. I was surprised to learn there are, are actually a few privately owned parcels that are in the shadow. Yeah. If it had been all county forest, it would have been yeah. even less meaningful. But... Yeah. Well, we've had any public comments by. So I'll open the public hearing at this time for text amendment PXT 2301. Is there any public comments that anyone wishes to make? If not, I'll close the public hearing. Any questions from the committee members? So this would be a recommendation to go to county board. It's just like a rezone, essentially. It has to be adopted by the full county board. Yeah, actually, this is regarded as low risk as it stands right now. Yep. Because we don't have these structures. If there were structures put in that uh, area, then it would yep. be high risk. Yes. And then and how I believe this works, too, is... Um, that once you adopt these ordinances, then they can change their their dam rating from like high or low. That I think that probably impacts insurance rates or whatever else that they're trying to do for insuring the the dam structure and so on. So, what else goes into the shadow area? Is it just kind of if it's high or low, what it potentially floods? I don't. Yeah, so I think what they're doing is they're con they have all the contours, the shape of the land. So if they model if the dam burst, you know how that wall of water essentially is going to come down, what, what areas it's going to flood, and how long before the wall essentially blends back into the existing river. It's an, it's an interesting model because it never is any higher than it is right at the dam in elevation, but of course the gradient of the stream valley and the width up between the high banks affects how fast it drops yeah. but eventually it disappears yeah. any questions from the committee if not is there a motion sure motion to approve this will be approved to take it to county board. Yeah. Yeah. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Mr. Lombard. Mr. Shemeski. Yes. Mr. Lombard. Yes. Ms. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Anderson walked out. Mr. Payton. Yes. Mr. Conroy. Yes. Mr. Bickford. Yes. Has been approved to go to county board. Should be on. This month's yet? Correct. It'll be on this month's agenda. Next, agenda of public hearings. We have a review and approval of preliminary plat, Maple Terrace. And I asked Jason before the meeting with 
not that they have not went to his town meeting yet. Is there any reason why we should not have approved it conditionally, right? Yeah, so I guess if, if you're considering an approve it, just make, you know, make the approval contingent on town of, you know, mean and being okay with with it or something like that as part of your motion. So um, it does meet the current zoning district standards. So it's not like they're asking for a rezone. Um, uh, probably I'm assuming, well, I shouldn't speak for Meenan, but I'm guessing it'll be the roads would probably be the only question that the town of Meenan would likely have or have a concern with. Right. So Mark, do you know, how do you mean, I, I think, are you going to ask the town to accept the dedication of roads? We're going to be talking to the town about, it. we've talked to them, we've had a howdy meeting with them already. And so we talked to them and we got their concerns. And so that's some of the things we've implemented on here. And then Maury Holtz, the owner is right here too. So if there's some questions of him, that's fine too. But uh, should we, we, I can go over some of the questions they the town had. Do you all have copies of the map or do you need copies? I've got. We have it in the, in the iPad, they have a copy. But, yeah. I'm just curious if, if you're if asking the town to accept the roads, that the plan we're, we're we're kind of looking at it. a lot of it depends on how it gets built out we're going to build it to town road standards and of course as everybody knows blacktop is very expensive and so yeah. forth and so um it's a matter of how we're going to do it if you look on here about halfway down uh, there's a darker line it's about halfway down at the 40 line um we're looking to do phase one first phase two second if things sell out or whatever on the first phase and we'll proceed with the second one so this is not all going to be built in one time we're looking to get approval for everything, you know, the approval of the plan so that we can proceed, but we're going to cut it off in half, basically. Um, frankly, you know, who knows if the market's going to stay exactly the way it is or how things are going to stay. And so um, I think it's prudent by not doing everything at once. As you know, the shady Oaks is the one right next door is all blacktop and there's two houses on it. So I think Mr. Wolf is not going to put the blacktop in. So we'll have some plans with the, with the committee, with the, Township on how to do it and, and what stations to do. Uh, one of the interesting things that, if you notice in the bottom, we show two easements going out to the south line. Um, they're having some questions and concerns, and it's rightfully so. And we've done this in Polk County before. And actually, it was a requirement of Polk County is to extend potential easements to the property line. And so that the future owner of the next land to the adjacent can continue the town road or continue the road on. And so we'd look at doing it and we'd probably just do it on the easterly portion. We've shown it on both for now, just for, for beginning, for showing where the examples it can be. It doesn't mean the owner is responsible to build it. If the neighboring parcel wants to build it, then they could build it. They'd have to, they'd have the easement be there. It, yeah. Otherwise what they used to have was called a spite strip. If you remember, if, if there was a subdivision in a, in a suburban area, the owner would keep the last five feet at the end of his road. It would cost a lot of money to get the buy that five feet to get to the next property, and so the, the zoning rules have gone over. Their committees, good planning is it. You know, we're trying to make good plan, and they're concerned because this is, you know, there's land right across from the courthouse. This goes all the way out that direction. So the question of the town is looking proactively, and we agree with it that you know they should provide a way to make it a through road so that the Towns, towns hate turning around on the cul-de-sacs or the plow guys do as you can tell with the snow right now so it, it, this isn't very far but you know you, you know you're right um, places where you go a mile to a dead end road you know up in, in Minong in a fire prone area you couldn't get out there's no other way out yeah. and it, we can't hook with we don't need to hook with shady oaks because that one does loop out it starts on 35 and comes out on midtown road but this one would be dead end there's some other ones too so uh that's it's a question or concern and so uh, more is we volunteered to have one, but we'll have more discussions with the town. Um, right now, we've shown acreage to the center line of the road. Very likely, this whole uh, roadway will be concerned out lot and deeded to the town potentially is the way we probably look at. It. So that's part of the planning process that we have to verify. Mark, may I have a paper copy of kind of old fashioned? Sure. Anybody else? I'm old too. <laughs> Have you done any soil work yet? Um, as Since you know, winter. I don't know if any of you know, this was Benton's property before. And so it was all field and it was actually 
approved for spraying septics on it at one time. Credentials. It was a pine plantation. It went to a septic drain thing, and now it's growing back. And so there's yeah, certain areas been, that are growing back. So we've been out there sometime, but I I, did, I normally would have looked at the soil maps. I simply forgot. Um, as you note, on I think nine and ten, we just showed one low area that's about ten feet lower than the rest of the area, and that doesn't even have water in it either. So um, it's fairly, you know, there isn't a wetland on the on the property. So you know, it's around there. You often expect it to be pretty sandy, but then there may be a clay lens down there, not too far. You don't know. Yeah. I haven't done any soil testing at all. We didn't quite hear him. But... Frank he didn't hear him. He said he had. I haven't done any soil testing on it. We just purchased the property late in the fall, and we're just. Well, we no, we can. It's just a matter of. Kind of systems happen. It could be round. Yeah. Lots of yeah. I, I would I would suspect all most of the conventional there could be a mountain site or two out there very possibly, but the lots are quite large. They're all two acres or better. So um we're we're not looking at small lots and there should be ample ample room there for it. So that's 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 always my question, you know that. We have a motion and a second. Yeah. I don't think anybody no, made a motion I, yet. No. Review and approval of preliminary plat for Maple Terrace. We we got a motion. Motion to approve the they, stipulation that the city. I want to mean and be okay with it. Yeah. Second that motion. Motion and a second. We are meeting with them on February 20th, a uh, week from Monday. Yeah. Mr. Blauberg. Yeah. Mr. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Conroy. Yes. Mr. Bickford. Yes. Thank you. Next. Let's take a five minute break. Sure. We'll have take a five minute break and then we'll go to the changes in chapter 45. <laughs> Yeah, so you know it. Just read it. Yes. Yes. I don't know if you put on there, but put that one. Okay. Okay. And they have a time for us. And I know he has a complaint with his conditions. So you have a common theme. Yes, I haven't uh, replied. And because I haven't gotten to looking into it yet, okay. but I I haven't forgot, okay. and I will. Not the word. Okay. 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 Okay.
Maybe we'll fix that. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. We don't have anything for the agenda for next month. Um, so chapter 45, you get a month off, so this meeting can go till two. Um, yes. So um, here's some proposed amendments um, that we did to chapter 45. Uh, this committee knew we had a few things we had to look at in there. So I kind of went through and made other minor corrections or changes or fixes uh, as I was going going through it. I don't you know, know if you want me to go page by page. I mean, that probably won't take too long if I do that. Um, a lot of these are pretty yeah, that's page basic. Two, and we can just like, like a note on yeah. page two. All you're doing is adding the abbreviation for ordinary hives. Yep. Stuff like that is just real clean. Yes. Yeah, I'm just trying to get, you know, we use these these abbreviations, at least staff does all the time, ordinary high water or OHWM. So we just trying to get the abbreviations in the ordinance so people are more familiar with it. Um, kind of housekeeping stuff. Yes, yeah, so a lot of housekeeping. So that's housekeeping was page two. Page three uh, was a few housekeeping things, uh, changing the URL on the DNR maps, the maps, the UR, old URL didn't work, put it to the new URL. Um, there's nothing on page four. Page five is housekeeping, a few abbreviations. Page six, adding the and slash or. Page seven, uh, there was some typos in there where it was referring to the wrong section. So again, clean that up. Uh, you will see there, I have some note there in gray on page seven. Um, I tried to amend that. Ordinance language in 2016, the DNR didn't like it. So I'm just saying that, you know, we try to make fixes and sometimes uh, we don't know or aren't allowed to. Uh, page eight, again, fixing a broken URL in there. Otherwise, housekeeping things. Page nine, mostly housekeeping. I did uh, add something down there on paragraph five for the open space. I thought it would just clear it up maybe a little bit that ex uses except uh, used to say uses except that accessory structures essential to the open space may be approved. I just put in there non habitable accessory structures. Um, we wouldn't want somebody putting like a bunkhouse or something on stuff that's supposed to be preserved as open space. Uh, we rarely get anyone to uh, try to apply for a PUD rezone anyhow, but if we do, hopefully that will clean it up. Page 10, housekeeping by fixing the department name. Page 11, um, I oh, did. A question is, yep. is we don't, the land services division, we leave in small letters with the land use and information committee, we capitalize. What is that? I have no idea. You could ask Muni code that why, because when I submit it to Muni code, then they go through and capitalize and make things. To make you feel as important as us. No, no, I do not know. And I don't want to be capitalized. So, um, well, it is there, but it's only the ministry. Am I capitalized? Well, I'll change it. Um, page 11. Um, so this is talking in the um, PUD uh, rezone process. I just added a note there, um, unless a different scale is approved, because let's say they're trying to do a large project, they might not be able to fit it on a one to 50 scale. It might, you know, you might have a giant piece of paper that's unwieldy to get at. So uh, just clean that up a little bit. Uh, Lines three and four there, I just changed it. Uh, we got new LIDAR in 2022, so I changed it to say the most recent LIDAR. Um, line 15, Craig will know things like this. You know, I changed the word should to shall. Mm -hmm. Should isn't mandatory, but shall is. So trying to clean up that language. Uh, line 34, unless a different scale again is approved. Page 12. Again, changing wording from may to shall, and again, allowing some flexibility in the scale. Uh, let's see, clean up department names, some abbreviations. Uh, line 45 down there, taking out com on the code. 
Oh, Jason, beforehand, all these acronyms, it's going to be like social services. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yep. Uh, page 13, adding ordinary high watermark. Uh, page 14, adding some acronyms, uh, fixing one missing word there on line 17. Page 15. Uh, line one there, changing that to land use from building permit. Um, most people wouldn't understand the difference, but a land use permit is what we issue. Building permits is what UDC issues. It was common before we adopted UDC regulations. All the counties up here to yep. mix them up. And yep. They weren't interchangeable. Yep. Um, lines 14, 16 there, just trying to clean up. Uh, this is for setback averaging, the shortest, instead of saying side, because I treat other lines as side lot lines, the, shade, the shortest line shall be used for averaging. Same thing down below. All right, page 16. So this is stuff is, well, we'll call it new. It used to be in the old ordinance, and I think when we went to Muni code or, no, when we went to split 30 and 45 apart, this whole section dropped out somehow. You and I were looking for that about three years ago and yeah. could not find it. Yep. Where did it go? And I put a note saying we got to adjust this the next time we open the ordinance. So here we are, um, <laughs> three years later, right on top of it. Um, so this one here is about back lot access. We allow, up, if somebody wants to try to have four back lots to use a lake access, um, so this is what we allow um, that lake access lot can't have a, you know, a house on it or it has to be basically natural, essentially. So, so essentially, we're just putting this language back in there. It, um, it, it has to be a buildable, developable lot. It can't just be a little shard. Of yes, yes. They can't use a junk, non-buildable lot as their lake access. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have a note here in gray on lines uh, 14 through 17. Um, because we always allowed one non habitable accessory structure, you know, if they wanted to have a, a pavilion down there or something for the people to use on the lake access lot. Um, now, so I, when I was kind of looking at what other counties were doing when I was going through here and making sure we, you know, had uh, had the right definitions and just seeing what other counties had out there, I kind of ran, ran across uh, Vilas County where they don't, um, allow privies um, near certain near dwellings. Um, so I kind of thought, you know, since we're opening up the ordinance, do we want to look at things like that right now? We allow privies right now, any essentially anywhere, if somebody wants to do one. Um, am, yeah, we get calls maybe one a year that somebody's a neighbor's maybe kind of shocked that they're like, why'd my neighbor put up a privy on their lake lot? Um, I as long as they we, get a permit from us. I think we looked at Washburn years ago, uh, not allowing the 10 foot side lot setback, mm -hmm. five feet even for a drain field, which would is underground, right? Yeah. To the line, but, but we didn't want the your privy in your backyard be in your neighbor's front yard. Yeah. So we tried to move it to the center of the lot or 50 or 75 yeah. feet. Um, when I thought about this, looking at this, I don't think it would be bad to have some accommodations for sanitation on a lot. Yeah, like that. exactly. But I might say vault privies or, or other non pit graph plumbingless systems, like an incinerating. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or uh, composting units are pretty benign, yep. that kind of thing, but not pit privies. Yeah. yeah. Because you tend to potentially have animals being able to dig under them and mm -hmm. other than that. Pranksters tip it over when somebody, mm -hmm. you know, nope. these stuff. Jason, can you explain 4588? The purpose of it again is for. So, if, if somebody wanted to have basically a, a keyhole access, we'll essentially would call it, I could do four housing lots on a off water, and then they could essentially share that one lake access. Okay. Um, it's, it's always been in the ordinance or at least has been in there for decades. Okay. There were times when we, we were talking about looking for it to, to make that an option for somebody trying to develop. There's one, one good waterfront lot left, but a whole bunch of back land that 
yep. could have been developed with some big parcels, you know, four tens or something sharing right. a lot waterfront access. And that, that would have been a, another option. They didn't have that, but they couldn't find it. Does this apply at all to Voyager? No, because Voyager is a PUD. They okay. have their own, your own development plan, essentially. Okay. And they yeah. have their commonly held yep. lots that will take access. Yep. I like what the guy was trying to do there on Devils. He had one access lot, and then he was going to put the RV park on. Top well, that's kind of where I think when we were looking for that language is when that campground was going to try to yeah. essentially keyhole. We were, we were arguing at using him as an example. If he used that lake access point as common for, for some horse people to own, you yeah. know, in day two up on the hill, that might have been a pretty viable alternative mm -hmm. but it never happened so yeah so basically i'll maybe look uh rewording that a little bit to say something about vault uh or incinerating or um yeah you know, like, like like sanitation sanitary devices under what is it 93 or 193 or whatever it is yeah and, but, yeah. but 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 not pit privies just to yep. exclude pit privies that would yep. be good enough because there are some interesting things that are equally good yep. <clears throat> uh let's see the rest of that page is just uh cleaning up acronyms uh page 17 again cleaning up uh i don't really see anything Too odd in there. Page 18 again, cleaning up, adding some abbreviations. Um, line 27 and 28. I was wondering, and this I'll probably have to wait till the DNR weighs in on this one. I was thinking, you know, because when you read what the state law says, uh, Vegetated buffer that covers at least 70% of the half of the shoreland setback area nearest to the water. People don't understand what that means. Um, so you could also state it as 70% of the area within 37 and a half feet of the ordinary high water mark. I think that's clear or more understandable. Yeah, uh, performance standard sort of. Yeah. Thing. So I, I don't know. I'm just, just trying to add that language for clarity. Um, so we hopefully have to explain it less times to people. Um, better make it the OHW there too. Oh yes, good catch. Can't forget one of those. Got to put my OHWM in there. Um, <laughs> got a yep, good catch. Um, see, then line thirty-five through thirty-eight. Uh, I was just adding that they need a land use permit. Now, this is for the gazebo provision. We call it. Um, and again, about that it can't be in the vegetation protection areas. Man, what am I slacking, huh? Oh, uh, let's see here, page 19. So this one has a little bit of change. Um, This was some, yeah, so we got lines 24, essentially through 38. This deals with walkways and stairways. Um, these items that were in yellow, well, items on lines 27, line 30, 34, 38, was in our old ordinance. I don't know why it disappeared. Um, we used to always have the, you could have one square foot, 40 square foot landing, the structure still being inconspicuously colored. So we're not gonna do the bright pink stairway or something, I guess. Um, so I don't know why that stuff was missing. So we're putting that stuff back in there. Um, let's see what else. Line 46, that is a recent change in state law. Uh, you can, now have, in some cases, you can have a fence within the lake setback, but only when it's tied to a roadway. 
So I think it must have been in more urban areas where people are trying to screen the traffic and the noise, mm -hmm. you know, but if they were the lot right next to the bridge, they couldn't put a fence because it was within 75 feet. So uh, we just added that language in there. Um, and then 49, adding that language in there too, that was um, from state statute already as well. Page 20, I do have something highlighted there in gray, line six to eight, that I tried to get some solar pan things added to buildings and the DNR didn't want that, um, that you could expand buildings by adding that stuff. I don't know. Jason, I have one question on that fence issue. Is that yeah. for the limit here? You can still have, can't have fences to the lake or you can't? Because there was a, there was, that Sorensen had a thing at the seminar last week, two weeks ago, saying that, there was a court case that made them have the had to allow fences to go to the lake or to the high water two feet back from the high water mark i think is what you i think that was this that was this okay. yeah okay. when i was because i was at that seminar or that right. session as well yeah. i think it was this that read yeah this is the law that came out of that court case oh, road or, okay. yes it was only because of a road there's no other because they didn't say because of a road no and the, the you know so, yeah. That's the bad thing about going to some of those seminars. You don't learn all the little details of everything. Yeah, I just um, want to make sure because I, that was a new rule that came by. Yeah, so you still can't, if you're just a normal rule lot in the Shoreland area, the neighbor's view, yeah. you can't have a fence within the 75, correct? Okay. Solid fence, right? You can't have any fence. Okay. Any yeah. Yeah. Open fence. Yeah, no, egg, egg is an exemption. Yeah. Egg is exempt from certain setbacks for egg fencing, but then you have to be in an egg district sure. in order to get that allotment. Um, let's see here. Some cleanup, yeah, on line 33 there. There was a typo on the section that was going to page 21. Um, this one, yeah, is lines 13 through 15 is more of a question for the DNR, I guess. You know, you we can, um, this is for setback averaging. Increase principal structure setback. Nobody ever really does this, but I did find it was kind of funny that, um, you know, let's say, somebody comes in and says, I want a 50 by 50 building, you have to allow me to build it at this reduced setback. And what if I were to say, well, yeah, but you can get a 30 by 50 building in there without having to reduce the setback. So is it the owner gets to build whatever they want and can reduce the setback or is there some sort of limitation on it? So I'm hoping that the DNR will give me a little clarity on that item. Um, otherwise the courts will figure it out sometime. So. Um, lines 20, 21, again, this is more of a, a DNR question. You know, they they say that we can't have any structures within the floodplain, but then how do you put a stairway down to a dock? That's impossible um, to not have part of it being the floodplain in some cases. Um, yeah, so it's more of some of these I'm kind of maybe jabbing at the DNR a little bit to say, hey, why don't you guys, you know, Try to clean up some language a little bit here for us. Um, page 22 was just clean up. 20. What's that? Set back at 40 foot. 939. Line 39. Unless, so this is our wetland setback. Unless exempt or reduced by other applicable regulations. Um, uh, again, I think you can have some like fencing within wetlands for certain egg purposes. So I'm basically trying to cover myself there to say, unless there's some other state or federal law that says you can be within the wetland setback. It says a building or a structure. That's right. Yeah. Forty-two and thirteen. Forty-two and thirteen. Yes. <laughs> yes. So is that exempt or not? Nope. Uh, 23, just some cleanup there a little bit. 24, it's 
some little cleanup areas as well. Uh, 25, I think maybe we should talk about for a minute because I this seems to come up once in a while. So right now we have in our ordinance, it says driveways um, have to meet, you know, certain requirements, 20 foot cleared width is, is how the ordinance says it right now. Um, and I've, I treat that as, you know, from tree to tree, you got to have at least 20 feet of opening in there. Now, some people seem to think that that 20 foot of cleared width should be 20 feet of gravel driving surface. Um, if you guys want it that way, then I would want to change the language to say that it must have a 20 foot width wide driving surface. Um, I'm sure if you were to ask, you know, fire departments, they would probably want, you know, they obviously want them probably wider and more drivable. Um, so I think that might be a case of where a driveway versus a private road. Private road serving multiple yeah. dwellings should be more than 10 feet probably but a driveway my driveway doesn't need to be right you know what i mean yeah that's but this is the issue that i get probably a decent amount of calls on is you know hey this driveway doesn't meet the standard and and when i say well it's, it's 20 feet from tree to tree and they're like well no we think it should be 20 feet of gravel you know, cleared with to drive on. Um, because we have it where people will literally do 2020 to tree, but then they'll then they'll have a ditch that you can't drive in. And so really the driving surface might only be 12 feet wide. Mm -hmm. You know, and if it's, it's one it's, person, fine, but if it's multiple, but it's hard, you know, even the fire departments don't like the one person idea because then they're like, we can't get our trucks and equipment back there very well. That you know, that that's an old, I mean, went back a long way with recommendations for turnarounds and whatnot that wouldn't fit on a 100 foot wide lot. Mm -hmm. So that's where some of these other yeah. things came from, yep. to be able to turn around. Yep. And I see you noted that that they, uh, some <laughs> departments think that puts a turnaround too close to the fire. I know. Which is interesting. Where? We have impervious surface issues too, where you want to minimize them in some places and, and, and you want a wider road in other places, you're going to increase the impervious surface stuff too. So mm -hmm. it's, we got some. We're going to get to impervious surfaces here pretty soon. I think too. I mean, some of the components of that as well. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's all counts, right? If it's yeah. if it's gravel and compacted, it's going to shed water more than infiltrate for sure. So my biggest, I guess, question is there is you know, are we just going to leave the language? The white is essentially what the current language is. Um, or do you want to add? certain things but again like i noted in there too uh, you know if we make more requirements it takes more time to enforce it and right now that one doesn't get enforced very well because you know essentially what do you do too do we go out there every five years and check to make sure they didn't plant trees closer to their driveway because that happens all the time too we start planting trees as soon as the bulldozer operator is loaded onto the trailer i know so but, it's like but the, the thing that that we, we uh the, the monitoring of that we I don't know if it ever came to pass that we were talking about in Washburn County enabling the fire departments to, that we're going to do some kind of a fee, driveway fee, small one, and that money would be segregated and provided to the fire departments to do inspections right. periodically because they had the opportunity really to, to impress on people how important it is better than we do. We go there and inspect the stake out of the building get back there to inspect the installation of the septic and you know the driveway is fine when the guy had to drive his heavy equipment in there and mm -hmm. all that and we used to tell the contractors to build the road the right size no matter what the property owner says mm -hmm. but the planting of the trees back you know i've driven down once 10 years later and balsams are hanging into the gravel mm -hmm. portion already mm -hmm. after 10 years you know and so if if, if we could convince some other a group to take some initiative to look at that and find a way to fund them a little bit to cover their mileage. You know, that might be a thought, but I don't, I agree. It isn't, first, it isn't, it's hard for zoning st staff to get to it. But secondly, the guys with the real clout are the guys who say, if you don't fix this, your house is going to burn down. You know, they're more, they'll believe them 
Sooner yeah, they'll else. believe that more than they will zone, you know, us just being the bad guy and telling them what to do on their property. I mean, my own fire department really liked the idea. I don't know if it ever happened after I left, to be honest. Yeah. So. So I'm just going to leave it then. <laughs> yeah, leave it. But but if somebody, you know, think just things to think about. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe there is a way. I mean, you know, there's some driveways I've driven down. And I'm like, I can't believe anybody came back here. But they have a propane tank. So it's like, all right, the propane guy must be somehow getting back here. I don't know how. I but... drove into one in the unzoned town of Basha one time to a site on the Yellow River. But because it was unzoned, um, we, our driveway ordinance wasn't in effect. I was driving an S10 pickup and I had to wiggle my mirrors to make it through the trees, mm -hmm. you know, literally. Yeah. This is this drive, no, you know, you barely can walk down this driveway, but mm -hmm. that was okay because we didn't have a regulation to compel mm -hmm. them to fix it. <laughs> uh, page 26. Um, yeah, fences, uh, again, some language clean up there. Um, further on page or lines 30 through 34. Um, what did I do there? Oh, this is, um, the vegetative buffer zone. So this is, uh, some of the items that we were told we had to clean up in our ordinance a little bit before. If you guys recall that, um, so this is what was suggested essentially um, by the DNR to us. So essentially, page twenty six um, and twenty seven, twenty eight. 29 essentially this is the this is the new guidance on that so. yes yeah, I, uh, yeah hopefully um so that's basically cleaning up the vegetative buffer zone language so yeah 26 we don't need to talk about volleyball courts. <laughs> uh, 28, 29. So that's all dealing with that stuff. Um, page 30 was just a little bit of cleanup again. Same thing, 31 and some abbreviations. 32. I'm cleaning up a few things. I do have a question on lines 12 through 15. That's a DNR question. Kind of, it doesn't make sense kind of how the language is worded there and how versus how they tell us at training sessions, how to apply it. So and that was like a remark was talking about too. The, you know, if you've got a lot that goes a long way back, you know, the first 300 feet slope towards the lake and the rest of it does not, yep. then you don't get to claim the impervious surface of the whole lot. You shouldn't, but it doesn't say it that way. Correct, but you you do, is how they tell that's us. What I mean. And that, yeah. that seems to be the wrong way to go about it. Yeah, It ought to be, with all of us, mostly counties now having topography. Mm -hmm. We can look without having to even go out and require somebody to do a lot of elevations. We can tell looking yep. what we have, and we should be able to use that. Mm -hmm. Page 33, again, just a little cleanup things. Page 34, again, little cleanup stuff. Page 35. Um, so this was a maintenance, repair, replacement of vertical suspension of non-conforming structures. I do have some questions for DNR there in lines 27 through 32. Um, is, Back in 2016, they didn't seem to like that language that we had in there. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll get some more input from them. Uh, you can kind of see my example in there of how, you know, if I had a one-story bar, bar restaurant 30 feet from the lake, it's zoned residential, that's a non-conforming grandfathered in use. It's non-conforming for the shoreland setback and it's non-conforming for the use. And 
So now I can rebuild in the same footprint. Should I be allowed to go to 35 feet tall? So now I can have a three-story bar, which essentially triples my space. And now, again, like I said, what about my parking, septic, my noise? Should that be allowed? Because that's a non-conforming use. The volume of the structure and the capacity of the structure would like could be argued to be an increase of the non-conforming use. That's what I think too, but they don't seem to feel that way. So it has been the most confusing language ever in zoning was mixing the terms of non-conforming structure and use mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it's, and it still is. Yes. So I'm hopefully you get a little clarification there. Um, let's see what else. <clears throat> Page 36, again, it's kind of the same lateral expansion of non-conforming principal structure. Again, I have that same general question, that same kind of example. Uh, page 37. Expansion of a non-conforming structure beyond the setback. Again, it's kind of the same example that I'm asking about on those first few lines. The rest of the stuff is really clean up. Line 39 is just saying the, the sewer system has to be brought into compliance on a relocated structure. Page 38, um, lines 29 through 31. So, so there was some law change or that was done in the past about if a variance structure that it, um, there was always a question of is a variance structure considered conforming or non-conforming? Because um, if it was conforming, then you didn't have the rights to do the rebuilding like a non-conforming structure would. Um, so this is me kind of asking the DNR question of, because what if it's been abandoned, you know, that variance shouldn't run forever, because um, there is law then that says if a structure is not used for so long, then it's considered abandoned. Um, I stumbled upon a case of like that, I think in that nonconformities handbook that I emailed around, okay. that involved a guy essentially building a house around a dilapidated mobile home, here the mobile home out and have you know, a non-conforming setback. And he originally applied for a permit and then applied for a variance and ultimately his variance was denied. Now, that had never been approved as a variance, but it was sort of similar to mm -hmm. the question. Yeah. And anyway, that ultimately was, it was uh, not approved. Yeah. Um, let's see, bottom of page 38, lines 38 through 40 is new section maintenance repair replacement of illegal structures. Um, so this is uh, language that's in the new model ordinance for the DNR. So that's where this came from. So that language we're adding there to be compliant with that statute 5969 to One K A two. Uh, let's see here. Page forty. Uh, you'll see some changes here. Those are because that <clears throat> state law changed uh, a few years ago when they first did the uh, viewing and access quarters. Uh, the law said you get thirty five per one hundred, and there was no cap. So if I had <clears throat> A thousand feet of shoreline, I could have 350 feet of viewing and access corridor. Well, now that law has been changed that the cap is 200 mm. by viewing and access corridor. And it never used to say anything about what about small lots? Because when it said 35 per 100, some county said, well, if you don't have a 100 foot lot, you don't get any viewing and access corridor. Uh, that probably wasn't the intent of the law, I would assume, <laughs> to not have someone not have access to the lake. Mm. Uh, so then they ch added that law in there too that says um, they get at least 10 feet. Um, so basically, I just cleaned up our kind of point system to reflect those new 
law changes. Um, page 41. So I added some things here on page 41. So these are mitigation tactics that people have to do if they're doing like a lateral expansion on a structure that's too close. Um, where people usually will do um, gutters on structures uh, or rock trenches or different things like that. Well, item I, we've had in our ordinance here where it said you get to install gutters on all structures. And if you did that, you got so many points. Well, we've had a few cases where people went, well, I don't need three points of mitigation. Maybe I only need one or two, but I, and I want to do gutters but I don't want to do it on all of them. Can you, can I do a proportion of them to get me the points? So essentially what we're doing is saying, all right, if you want to gutter, you know, the roof side that's towards the lake, you want to gutter that side and get it to a rain garden and you only need one point and that does it. Hey, then you great. You don't have to gutter every little shed and thing that you have all over your whole entire lot to get the points. Cause it was basically all or nothing is how it was so trying to give a little more flexibility in there kind of. yes yeah um and that's the same thing with item j there on that page where it used to say you had to divert all water from all hard surfaces to a rock garden or range uh rain garden or rock trench well now we're again kind of saying all right maybe if you don't need the four points you only need two well maybe you can divert some of your driveway to a rain garden, you know, Priority proportionally. Where, where yeah. the best. Obviously we're trying to get it. So the stuff that's closest to the lake isn't going, you're running off into the lake. So, but, you know, arguably that should make more people be willing to do it. It should. Doing. Yes. Yes. Um, 42 is just a little cleanup item there. <clears throat> 43 was clean up. 44, the same thing, nothing uh, until 47. Again, that's just cleaning up things. <laughs> 53, again, cleaning up, adding the section, what the section down in the range means. 54, adding some abbreviations. Uh, 55. So, and I don't know how much we want to get into mobile home manufactured home parks. Um, I know it kind of came up on the last one that came through for approval that maybe we should look at kind of like we did with campgrounds. You know, do we want to look at, do we change parcel sizes, density requirements? So basically, I added some notes in here, you know, do we want to look at some of this stuff now or do we just want to? I think, I think there's a few things we should look at for sure. Um, one question, we, we keep saying mobile home park and mobile, you know, it's left over language. Yep. I mean, mobile home hasn't been approved since 1975. Correct, but there's probably some of those structures still out in mobile home in the park, parks. I would think just like campgrounds, they would be trying to cycle them out. Oh, I'm sure they are, but there is some out there. I guess, you know, just, just a thought. That's why I leave the language in there, only because I know there's some of them out there. Maybe we should reorganize it to call manufactured home communities then like in parentheses aka mobile home parks or something yeah i mean mobile home park is a term that the general public uses for all of them yeah and then that was, um, i mean i'm just thinking that we, we we don't want to imply that it's okay to bring one to a new one correct it really isn't typically correct they don't accept them you know yep. just a thought though and i do think we want to talk about density though because right now we're a lot higher density than campgrounds and it seemed to me that six is too many Based on even what people want to design today, mm -hmm. it's kind of running through my head. The one we recently approved, probably four would have been fine for that. I think, oh, I think he, he's even maybe down. He's well, depending on when you start taking out developable acres. Yeah. Um, if we use developable acres, I think yeah. four would be the most. Three or four would be a better number. Because mm -hmm. what did we do for campgrounds for developable acres? Five. five. Oh yeah, because it was ten. We went to yeah. five. Mm -hmm. Don't have to necessarily write that in stone today, but I think that's what we should contemplate. 
Well, I mean, I, I like, I'd like to have at least a number for us to have the public hearing about, you know, so. Let's put three in a public hearing and if somebody complains, we might bump it to four. Okay. And I think that's a better number. More realistic <laughs> with what, what we would like to see. Uh, we're then when we're talking developable acre, there's going to be a lot more acres taken up with septics and roads and setbacks and yep. whatnot. So, yep. so it's still going to be better than they thought. Yeah. Are you still okay with the minimum size, five acres? I think so, because right. I can see you know, when we get into the egg stuff, we still have all kinds of language about multiple manufactured mobile homes for farm workers and stuff. Yep. I think we don't we need to, I think we got to keep that, but I think we have to fix that too down okay. the road, but yep. not right now. And then my other question, lines 29, 30, uh, you know, right now the language says all drives, parking areas and walkways shall be hard surfaced. I know in the past we, people have questioned us, what does that mean? Is that gravel or asphalt or concrete? I treat, I think of a hard surface as gravel. I don't um, disagree. You treat gravel as impervious. It runs, water runs off of it. Right now with the price of road oil, uh, you know, it's, it's almost prohibitive to do things. Yeah. You don't allow that as an option, at least. So what I think I'll just do is I'll just define hard surface or something in the ordinance to say gravel, asphalt, or concrete. Yeah, maybe there's probably a standard for how much gravel for like public road or something, three, four inches. Something probably. Like Let me use that. The, Think about it. Yeah, because once you drive on it, it becomes pretty hard packed anyway. So except for the, except I don't for the think, top little I don't think bit. Somebody to put this much down yeah, as standard. Yeah. Well, yeah, they probably will. And then yeah. we're going to have to go out there with a shovel now and dig through the gravel now. Check how deep it is. Dig through it your foot, you know, it's not okay. Yes. Yeah, so okay, I'll put that in the definition. <laughs> Does that include um, like recycled concrete asphalt gravel? I would consider that gravel. Yeah, I, mean, I would too. I just wanted to, yeah. want to spell that yeah. out, because I've got recycled asphalt on mine. You could even say then, you know, yeah, because you could say people have crushed concrete too right. out there. Um, um, I, uh, I'll come. I will we'll come up with some sort of wording. Yeah. Uh, what else do we got here? Page 56, <clears throat> uh, just adding some clarity to the manufactured home park things, uh, adding the, but they need to have a map on file, which is what we already do anyhow. Um, need a CUP, which is again, what they already have to do anyhow, uh, that they each have their own address. That's how we treat them already anyhow. And what do we got? All other local, federal, state requirements apply, and that you may require additional setbacks. Um, let's see. Rest is just a little bit of cleanup there. Chase, a quick question. One of the things we've come up with in Oakland is the identity, identifying the number of the sites. We seem to have a lot of maps come in that they don't identify the site. So when, when fire EMS goes there, they don't know where to go. Yep. It's, does that is that covered in 15? Oh, uh, well, I thought we said something in there about that they shall have a there is some type that says they have to have a, a, a site number, a site right? number. Uh, um, on line 25. Each mobile home or manufactured home must have a unique site address. Well, that's yeah, that's a that's a site that's so that's like my number, you know, 25865 oh. address. So each manufactured home park should have, each one should have their own fire number sign in the manufactured home park. I know with campgrounds, we have the issue of site one, two, three, four, and you're out there and they don't have any site numbers labeled so you don't know where you're going. Ran into the problem in Wildwood uh, a couple of weeks ago was, you know, you have one access, which is Wildwood Lane, and then you have two other roads actually coming around. Mm -hmm. and they're not all Wildwood Lane, yeah. but on the on Wildwood Lane, there was a fire number. And then 
one block away on the next road was the same number. And the fire department originally went to the wrong place. They went to the one on Wildwood Lane where they were supposed to be on the Ivy, Ivy or whatever. Or Ivy Wood or something. Yeah, you know. Ivy or something, whatever it was. Um, yeah, that's there more anything numbering and road naming problem there. yeah i mean and you know since it's on a different road technically you can have it the same address the, the whole there's an address grid essentially that lays over the whole county mm -hmm. and if you're at, at that height or east west that latitude yeah. um then you should you know that would be your technical number um yeah, and it's tough when you're in those tight spots where you can't be skipping too many numbers because then you've run out of numbers essentially. Um, yeah. That's a, a road sign issue there, really. Yeah, I mean, I would have hoped there would have been road signs at that intersection so they would have known that Ivy Wood is the left-hand turn, and if there's not, we should get a road sign out there. Well, I'm, I'm sure there's a road sign on that corner, you know. But, yeah. But, but the problem was when they when they turned on Wildwood Lane, they weren't thinking that there was, there was another, another turn. road. They, they stopped the block over. Number, they, as as they were just going looking for this number. Looking yep. for that number. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, the, the numbering system is not completely foolproof. That's part of no, it. it is not, unfortunately. What really was on the after the fire used to dryer, but. Ideally, maybe you know that's it's a it's a pain, but maybe a number like that that's duplicated so close by ought to be changed one digit or something. Yeah, that's so, that's what I mean. I mean. That might you know it's something to look at, but then that makes you have to change your address, yeah. which is inconvenient. And your driver's license and your mail and your bank you accounts. Have a letter behind but, it. But when you remember, <laughs> what I know, yeah. when they when we're okaying these mobile home or manufactured home sites. Maybe that should be incorporated in. Hey, but you can't have the same number within one block of each. Yeah, other. we could. You know, maybe you have to make that a rule, other than that. Uh, make sure that the when we assign them, we don't. We make sure that. Yeah, we can it. try to consciously not do it. Um, I can't guarantee that we wouldn't no. accidentally do it though. Yeah, but this um, was probably there back when the numbering system was implemented. Probably. Yeah. And so they. Yeah. And the contractor doing it, you know, it wouldn't yeah. have cared. But yeah. we we can put that as a note to self, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's no different than in a village. You know, you have First Street and then address one ten, and there's a one ten Second Street, a one ten Third Street. Um, yeah. You almost just have to realize when you're in those congested areas that you really got to pay attention to the road names. You got a guy putting the numbers up, and the contractor made a mistake had a partially open box he didn't use and misnumbered a whole road mm -hmm. and then went back like on Monday found it and we we're changing them all you know a guy came in the office just outraged because he got his number and he changed his address and did everything and sent all his stuff in did anybody tell you that was your number have you been notified to change your address no well they made a mistake well you have to redo it that's all well yeah, that's I mean, that kind of thing happens. No difference in there. I can follow up and I don't know if it's Grassburg or not. You have Williams Road. Oh, and they both got the same yeah. house numbers on them. Oh, yeah, there's a Williams Road and Wood River. Yeah, yeah Wood yeah. River. And their magnitude, is, magnitude is about the same. They are the same. Yeah, what does that mean? Because they're not the same amount of the exact so. same yeah. number on the same kind of issue. Wow. Well, they're in different, they should be in different postal districts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we we know, I know we do not want to do duplicate numbers in the same postal district, but yeah, they might be in the same fire district though. But if if they get called in to dispatch to that number in Williams Road, fire department, well, which one we're going to? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that, there's, you know, there's a couple other places in the county that are saying well you and it's, you know there's like seven bass lake roads i think in the yeah. county or if not yes. more so it's yes. yeah when you get those common type road names unfortunately that happens yeah, why not yeah. name it's bass lake road old bass lake road <laughs> and 
and virtual it's Bass Lake Road got to stay Bass Lake Road. Yeah. They worked it out. We worked hard with the towns to yeah, try to back when the number system issue. was put in effect. The roads that goes uh, uh, Chuck's place was the same as what was in the village of Webster. Mm. And they had to change one, and it was a real hassle to change the road name because people are used to that. So that's yep. my road. You know? Yeah. Yep. Think about going around you know, the, the, the county road, the England County Road. Yeah, yeah, it changed that. You think? Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. it used to be. Yeah, it all around Yep. Yeah, that's a controversial thing when you start changing people's addresses. Yes. They do not like that. So, page fifty-seven is just minor changes. Uh, page fifty-eight. I guess I kind of have a question for the committee. Line thirty-five, thirty-six. Um, you know. We have, we've had this section in here about major recreational equipment, you know, how you can, where you can park and store it. But then I got to kind of think and I'm like, well, there's really no definition of what major recreational equipment is. <laughs> um, so in my mind, um, you know, maybe, maybe somebody thinks that snowmobile trailer is major recreational equipment and it shouldn't be parked there, but maybe I don't think that is. Um, I mean, right now it's, Mostly geared towards campers, um, campers, and motor homes, campers and motor homes, RVs, those type of things is what it's a big boat. Well, I don't know. Is yeah, that a big boat would be a recreational equipment? Yeah. But do we want to start telling everybody they can't park their boat in their yard? Boat in their yard. I think we want a pretty narrow mm -hmm. definition of probably large campers and maybe big motor homes. Yeah. Or do you state a size? You have to figure out a way to come above a certain. Length, maybe. Yeah. I don't. I I can't come up with a number. Not having not owning one. I don't. Yeah. Well, I'll try to come up with something for the public hearing, and then we can hash it out at that there. point. Um. And then forty two forty three. So again, this language says, you know, that if I want to store this equipment on a lot. Um, that it has to be stored so it's not visible from the water. Well, what if I have no buildings? <clears throat> Just think, an empty lot that you bring a camper up once in a while. And yeah, I think I think there. some of that argument was that somebody you know was getting around the the short term placement by mm -hmm. saying I'm just storing it there mm -hmm. seventy five feet back by having a big uh, motor home. Maybe yep. a, maybe yeah, a distant you into that discussion. A few years ago, yes, we did. Had to have a different color tarp over. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, we kind of, you know, and that's <clears throat> kind of why yeah, I have yeah. I have the sentence there. Does covering it meet the requirement? So I mean, if maybe that's the case, we'll just say if it's covered, then we'll assume it's stored. <clears throat> right now, it's a lot easier to see it from the lake than it is in June. Whether exactly. Component. I think yeah. leave it with covered. Okay. The biggest issue that's on the lake, we we go on all the time, is still all the docks and boat lifts that are laying on the shoreline about six months out of the year. They're worse than the other things you store there, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah they look nothing yeah. nothing yeah. you can do about it, but that's that's the biggest. Well, technically, thing. you could. You could say that those have to be stored at least 75 feet back, but do we don't want somebody tearing apart their whole property, cutting every tree down so they can get their dock system stored back 75 feet and their lifts and everything else it's, it's odd because you have a house that's all protected in 35 foot viewing corridors and here all you see is their docks and their boat lifts sitting in front of their places all year round basically if I, yep. I think you also have the unintended consequences of when they are in view of the water where you have homeowners that rent out their house in, in my neighborhood they would rent out their house and then come and live in their motor home in full view of the lake so there, there are situations where this so-called equipment is being used as a seasonal residence mm -hmm. in, in, in plain view of the lake. And that's, that frustrates the homeowners that pay taxes to live on the lake. Yeah, and that's why I'm trying to get some clarity. You know, do we say it has to be covered? Because I get that all the time. People say, well, my, I'm just storing that camper there. I'm like, really? You have the slide outs out? You have a deck or a carpet out in front of it? I'm like, really? You're storing? It's plugged into the electric? Yeah. Come on, it's not hot. stored. Yeah, you know, it's like well, so. I, agree. I think well, that covered would make it make a difference because at least if they have a blue tarp on it, 
Yeah. Uh, it covers the windows a little bit. They want to have quite a good view of the window. It kind of and identifies then, the intent is to store. Exactly. If, if we have too many blue tarps in the future, we'll address that regulation down the road. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> but do it. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Uh, um, page. Uh, let's see here. Sixty is just clean up there of that one what, what? line. Page sixty. I'm on. Fifty nine. That was just changing. Yeah, uh, it's on page sixty. Oh, the chart yeah. keeps going. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Six. 60 was just clean up 61. This, uh, let's see, line 16 through 21. This will probably get a little confusing. So right now we have chapter 45 that we're looking at. That's the shoreland ordinance. We have chapter 30, which is the general zoning ordinance. Both of those have sections that deal with other non-conforming uses and structures. The language that we have here in chapter 45 um, says they can expand up to 50% of the envelope and, and replace up to 50% of the structural components. So that means they can't do a full teardown and rebuild. Um, they could only replace half of the structure and make it half is essentially another half again bigger. Now this is for not for things that are non-conforming to the lake only, because that has a separate statute that I get to tear down, rebuild in the same footprint, go up 35 feet tall. So this might be a structure that's only two feet from a property line, you know, um, in the road setback. or a road setback, some other setback or non-conforming issue that it has. So that's how chapter 45 is written. Chapter 30 says they can't expand more than 25%, but they allow, we allow the whole entire thing to be rebuilt. So do we want to make them consistent? Because um, right now, if somebody is too close to a lake, you would say chapter 45 and 30 applies. Um, so the most restrictive applies. So that would be chapter 45. But then if I am more than a thousand feet away from a lake, chapter 45 doesn't apply. So chapter 30 does. So essentially you could say, well, I'm, I'm on this, where me and my neighbor way down the road are both too close to the road. I happen to be near a lake, so I can't tear down and rebuild my whole garage and add on um, a certain size. Just because I'm near the lake doesn't mean I'm on the lake, but my neighbor down the road who's maybe has a garage that's just as close to the road setback as me can tear down, rebuild the whole thing brand new and add on to it. So it's just whether or not your chapter 30, chapter 45 applies. <clears throat> question no matter how we do it it's going to impact people they can always apply to the boa for a variance no matter which route we go but i think they should be at least consistent so people aren't it's, getting confused by it's often the, often that is a too close to the right over the too close to the rear lot line road setback that the boas have been concerned about safety to the road um <coughs> so it, that they often want the entry to not be at the mm -hmm. room to come in and out kind of mm -hmm. thing. And so within that context, it would seem like the 45 lane, which would be more encouraging to build it, rebuild it farther back. Correct. In that case, I think the, the issue on the rebuild in the shoreland area for the dwelling was because that got to be such a big issue that you know, the, the original intent of NR 115 was to get everything to meet setback, but that never really happened. Yep. Case law, variances, and all that allowed that to happen. So I think it's a different rationale for the established waterfront setback versus where you'd encourage for the public interest to take yeah. off the roadway. Yeah. That, that's how I would probably go with it. So it's just me, though. Yeah. Most people follow your lead, so I'm thinking we'll I don't have to sell it to anybody. But. <laughs> so I'm thinking we'll leave 45 the way it is, and then we'll, whenever we open up Chapter 30, we'll modify that language. Yeah. 
If it turns out we got to modify it the other way, fine. But yeah. I think the one that was an intent to reduce the nonconformity where possible. Yes. Merit. Yes. Uh, page 62 is just adding some def or cleanup, adding some acronyms. Page 63, uh, same thing, just a few cleanup items. And the zoning administrator is not capitalized this time. <laughs> cool, good. Um, page 64. So this is a, something that I did add. So this is talking about, we're in the section about permits and we have language in there that says a land use permit shall expire 12 months from the date that it's issued unless a 12 month extension is granted. But then and this kind of goes back to the Camp Croy case where, what was that, 2018 maybe? They wanted to apply for a CUP for 15 years out saying they wanted all these phases um, some people uh, said, no, you can't do that. You can only ask for a few years based on what the language says in your ordinance. So we basically have been operating that way, but we never added really any language for clarification in our ordinance to kind of explain that. And we've been essentially letting people apply for stuff for three years is how we've been doing it for the last, probably since that 2018 item. So I thought we'd just add, uh, section there that kind of just makes it clear about conditional use permits, you know, that they're uh, valid for up to three years, or mm -hmm. they can be up to three years if the applicant asks for it. Um, you know, that just means they have to have started. Yeah, and they so got to have it operating. It doesn't, it doesn't mean like, if, uh, like we did the one, the one up on uh, Yellow Lake at one time. He had up to three years, but he could, as long as he had the footings in and then started working on the walls within that three years, he was all right if it took him five years to finish doing the whole thing. Generally, yes. It's kind of, I'd say the uh, Parita Road one would be kind of an example of this yeah. where um, it's the applications, he, you know, somebody wrote in the application, it will be over three years or five years, I can't remember what one it was. And then he was, claiming he didn't write that on there. Um, so okay. I'm just figured, well, why not put it in the code? And then there's no question about it. Well, yeah, it clarifies. Uh, just a thought on word, words, though, is wonder if, what would happen if we said the approval is good for up to three years, because the permit doesn't take effect until it's you know, in operations. Correct. Right? You know what I well, mean? the approval. Approval though, but if they operate it, then the approval continues. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. It doesn't expire, but Correct. you get approved to, to do something by conditional use permit, but then you have three years to get it underway. Yeah. And then your permit runs for, uh, unless you cease for more than 12 months. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but you're getting an approval to do it first. And if you haven't exercised that approval within three years, it, it expires. Okay. You know, I'm not sure if that's better or not. I'm just Okay. Trying to differentiate between getting approved to do it and actually doing it. Yeah. But you have a neighbor basically putting a couple bricks up every year for 20 years. Well, and that's why I think there needs to be some. Sort I, of well, I have the language that says if it's not constructed and operating, you start over again. Then you start over. And I kind of like that but they can ask for permission for more because it's kind of like you know you know COVID or materials or whatever it's like I just need a little bit more time because otherwise I think we could have these messy construction sites stretching out allow people if it hasn't been past three years to come in and ask for an extension we've right. done that yeah. yeah that I like that language where I mean it says that and then they can ask for an extension not that as long as they keep working on it I yeah think that could be a mess i agree that's more clear cut as long as they do it before it expires it has to do it with it before three years is up but what he got in yellow there it says no conditional use permit extensions will be allowed well yeah and that's and that's that's through my office you know they can always come through you guys and apply for a new cup or do whatever they want so what i'll have to do um 
I'll change that where no conditional use permit extensions will be allowed. I'll just say that the applicant can come back to the committee. Now, would we charge them though? Sure. 300 bucks? Sure. We can that's, say that's your that's fault for not, yeah. not getting done. If we're willing to extend it, um, people that were interested in the application initially should be yeah. aware okay. of that. As, as, as Karen said, I could see that somebody has some kind of a circumstance that befalls them and they just flat out don't get it started. Two years later, they come back in and say, I, I still want to do this, but I need more time. Mm -hmm. And we, we know, had that feature. Yeah, we have. We ran out of money. Mm -hmm. Lots or, of things happen. Yeah, unemployment, um, an injury or some health, long term health issues that have cropped up. Uh, let's see, page 65, lines 28, 29. I'll probably talk a little bit with Dave Mundell about this too. This talks about revocation of a CUP. Where it's, you know, right now the language says where the condition of the conditional use permit are violated, the conditional use permit shall be revoked. Well, my question is then, but well, by who? Um, and then I know when I've talked to Corp Council in the past, he said, well, I'm not going to let, he wasn't going to let me do it. He was going to say that's got to come to the committee. So I, I want to get some clarification in there. The language about due notice and publication and yep. public process. All yep. Yep. Um, page 66 was a lot of cleanup other than lines 33, 34. So this talks about items that are appealed to the board of adjustment. Um, and it says right here, you know, any uh, by any decision of the zoning administrator, the committee or administrative officer. But then I don't think a rezone would go to the BOA. So I need to modify that as language where it says any decision by the land use committee. I think in its administrative decision is or ministerial one yeah this result is a legislation act by the entire county board so no yeah right it doesn't go to them so i want to add some link clarity in there because we've had that question asked yes. before yes we have um so i'll add some i'll work with uh corp council on getting some language in there page 67 uh, that was just Deleting a duplicate sentence up there on the top. Page 68, a couple of cleanup things. Page 69, um, this starts with a lot of our definitions. Uh, you'll see on lines 20, 21. This is again more of a question for the DNR. Um, right now, it talks about. Shore is used in the definition of access and viewing corridor, but we all call it the ordinary high water mark. I mean, that's the nomenclature we use, but shore is used in R115. Um, so essentially, we're not going to be able to change it. I, I think the DNR will say that you can't change that word from shore to ordinary high water mark, but maybe I'll add a definition to define shore as essentially being the same as the ordinary high water mark. Um, Cause that's what we regulate to is the ordinary high water mark. So. Back to 68. Yes. I don't know why I've got it under here. Oh, five, two. Yeah. So this is enforcement and penalties lines 28. Maybe I did it. I don't know. Yeah, you did it because it's not underlined in mine. <laughs> you, you hit that thing. Another question is why did you underline it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about violations. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Page back to page 69. Um, just some cleanup. I did add a definition of artificial. Um, page 70, <clears throat> I added 
uh, different definitions for beach. And this is again, me going through like other counties and seeing how they had stuff to find. And then I got to thinking, I'm like, wow, that's pretty good to define. It is good. Yeah, I've always wondered why a lake named Sand Lake would have a couple of artificial beaches put on this sand yeah. on the sand. Yeah. It was white sand, I guess. But how yes. Um, so yeah, added some definitions of boathouse dry and wet. That's always been a, a you know, DNR regulates the wet ones. We regulate the dry ones. So I'm just trying to get that clarification in there. Uh, added definition of buffer. Uh, let's see here. Page 71, added a definition of construction trailer. It's pretty sad that we have to do all these things, but because um, I have a few people that are have construction trailers and they're trying to claim that they're campers, but then they're not built to the camper regulations. Um, and then, so I'm just trying to add definition of construction trailer and say, and well, if we're going to treat it as a camper or you, it better be a legit construction trailer. And if it is, then you should have a permit to do some sort of construction on your lot. You shouldn't just be putting a construction trailer there on a vacant lot. So if you're building a house or, you know, garage, yeah, you should, it should make sense to have a construction trailer there. But otherwise, it shouldn't be there. Um, do, 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 do. Lines 39 through 41, you know, we have a definition of DAC that goes right to SPS 320-07-21-M. Um, then when I was looking at other counties, Barron County has a definition of DAC that I liked. Um, again, it's basically, you know, wordsmithing to try to get through court if we have to. I mean, essentially, because attorneys are going to argue it no matter how you have it worded. So um, couldn't we like, use the Barron County definition and then put also as per. The yeah, we could do something like that. Really, definitions are important to have as yes. precise as possible. Yes. Uh, page 72, I uh, cleaned up a little bit of the definition of dwelling single family, added a dwelling two family definition, um, added the definition of excavation, added, uh, cleaned up the definition of family. Uh, um, Added a definition, definition of filling. Again, these are all because of items we've gone to court on or had disputes with attorneys on, so we get to add more definitions. Uh, fire pits, uh, so there was a county that had those defined, and I thought, wow, that's really actually kind of cool that they uh, went through the process and defined fire pits, so I think I added a few things to it, but because, again, we always have discussions with people when they say, well, that's just my fire pit and it's a 20 foot diameter circle concrete, you know, and, and I'm saying, well, that's a patio around a fire pit. And they're, no, it's just a fire pit. That's so nope. they don't set the woods on fire. That's why. I'm exactly. So it's like, all right, we'll define fire pit then. Um, page 73, added definitions of attached and detached garages, again, because we get into arguments with people or disagreements about what a detached or attached garage is, and should I be living in that portion of the building or not? <laughs> so, uh, let's see, grading, added definition of that. Uh, added a little bit of clarity about how we consider gravel impervious. Page 74, uh, major recreational equipment. We kind of talked about that earlier that I wanted to clean up that definition. Yeah, you know, again, unlicensed car. Is that a major recreational equipment or not? I don't know. Especially with the size of the SUVs now, mm -hmm. you know, they just 
Yeah. Uh, definition of marina, that was never in our ordinance. I thought that might be a good one to add. Uh, definition of native. We talk about native species a lot in our ordinance, but then we didn't have it defined. So when they want to say that Japanese knotweed is native to Japan, um, <laughs> we should say, well, we want stuff native to Burnett County. Um, page 75, uh, added definition of parcel, added definition of patio, again, to help with some possible litigation thing. Uh, added definition of portable toilet facility. Those are the biffies or the things that you know people typically have. Like I, I think I say in here, it's usually on a construction site, or if you're having a wedding or something, that's usually when they're there. But some people think that it, they just want to leave it there year round, um, and we we probably don't want that. It doesn't meet, doesn't meet the code exactly. So yes. Uh, added a definition of privy, added a definition of retaining wall. Again, since people have disagreements on what retaining walls are, uh, we define it. Page 76, uh, added definition of setback, uh, added definition of shed. Again, keep the, try to keep the people from living in the sheds. Uh, added definition of slope. Definition of soil disturbance, definition of storage container. We treat them essentially the same as sheds or garages, but figured we should define them. Page 77, some cleanup, added a definition of walkway. That's it. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Yeah. You have to once with any right? Yes, right. So I will make the changes that we talked about in here, and then we'll make it for a public, it'll be noticed as a public hearing for April meeting. So we good on that one? Good. All right, next. We're almost going to be here till our next meeting. Yay. Um, next is the zoning and uh, land information reports. Uh, the reports are in your packet. Uh, try to find them here. Got to get them open in my computer here. So uh, let's see here. You got some miscellaneous items there. Um, about a quarter million dollars going back to the general fund from our department at the end of 2022. Nate, love you. Yes. Uh, basically, I explained that that's partly from an open position, doing a little bit less contract work with Barron County, didn't do any cleanup properties of last year. Some various small items of savings, and then the revenue was 178 higher than budgeted, basically. And that's a hundred thousand from grant money, essentially, and 79 from our revenue being higher than we thought. Uh, website statistics are in there. Did some reports to basically show 96% um, of the users are desktop, 4% are tablets over last year. 98% uh, of the users are from the United States over last year. Next is India, 1%. Uh, staff reports are in there too. So what's with India? Why well, we I'm thinking there's contra or various banking and or those type of entities that maybe have some employees in that country. I'm guessing they're doing searches maybe where taxes paid like they were supposed to be as part of the mortgage. Um, I don't know what other things would. I mean, I don't know if real estate transactions, but again, that's maybe like a banking issue. That's all I can probably think of. How do warranties? <laughs> Um, 
Let's see what else is in there. Yeah, so the budget report is in there showing that for the for the end of the year 2022. What else is in there? Um, we got the permit numbers for 2022 are in there for the year end. 110 new dwellings last year. 290 sewer permits. I do have a graph or two down there. Um, 69 short-term rentals seems like a fair Yeah, we're starting to you know get on them a little bit more. Um, yeah, I think I looked in 2018, we had like five of them had permits. So 2019, we had like eight. So we're slowly getting there. Um, once that new vendor comes together, uh, with the towns and associate or the uh, development association, I'm sure we'll get a lengthy list of other ones. Yeah, that's your, so for your, I just got a note. We just hired a, the coalition, just hired person. She accepted the position today to be on board for to coordinate with local development, which is people we're going with yeah. to coordinate us with them. She she'll be on board as. So if she gets back from Florida. Cool. So as of this morning, we made the decision yesterday and uh, during this meeting this morning. So you should be getting and we should be uh, having an update as soon as we can get our, our municipalities in line. Yes. <laughs> We're creeping back up for the five minutes. Yeah, and you know, we had that peak, like I you know, I like sewer permits, I guess, is kind of a one that you're familiar with. I like to look at, too, because that kind of shows you a trend of what's going on. And, yeah, you know, we peaked there in 2004. And then it was kind of, you know, crashed a little bit with the 08, kind of hovered, hovered. And then 2019, 2020, 21 really started picking up and then yeah now 22 so i don't know you know are we going to crash hard have a soft landing i don't know Just so that i think there was such a surge last year yep pent up held back yep. stuff. but that's always a good indicator because it's it's uh, you know, something you have to do yeah it's, it's fairly labor intensive for that and shows you where you're at I mean, so when I talk to like local contractors, they're all saying they're still busy. Um, local architects are saying they got people calling them about plans and building. So I don't, you know, I don't, I don't see a big crash coming at least, but we're always kind of near the backside, I think, of what happens in the more urban areas. Um, interest rates are what hovering or maybe even tick down a little or hovering kind of hovering. They were so from what they were but yeah i've always looked at it as we never crash as far as some of the more urban areas or the county's perimeter you know, that main business was yep. suburbia yep. You know, recreational areas always never dropped as far it also never peaked as high yeah there's some disappointed people when i tell them we still got an hour to go on this meeting <laughs> <laughs> They can learn how government works at this level, right? At this community. Um, so that's all I have for that. Uh, future agenda items. I think I have two applications and there is no March meeting because now since we changed those dates of when they have to have submittals, we didn't get any submittals prior to January 15th to get on the March meeting. So we don't have a March meeting, but we will have a few items for April. So. Anything else? Well, I have a motion to adjourn. I mean, yeah, it's with I got to start again. Start again. <laughs> well, you get it, you get it stretch a little bit. Oh, my goodness. Ten minutes. Nope. Oh, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't second. Uh, second. Second. I'll second. second. Oh. Yeah. Doesn't matter. A name a good idea. We're, we're all ready to leave, so just put a name down. Sure.